Good evening, and thank you for joining city staff uh, during this evening in this virtual meeting environment. My name is Min Tai, and I am the executive director for the Building and Planning Agency. Almost five years ago, the city set out a goal to comprehensively update the general plan. While components of the plans were updated periodically throughout that entire uh, 40, almost four decades, the last time it was comprehensively updated was in 1982. That's almost four decades ago. Our goal today is to take you from the beginning and bring you up to date, and we will go over the objective of the general plan update. Uh, we'll have discussion on next steps. Then along the way, we'll stop for a pause for questions and answers. Scott, if you can help me uh, advance to the next slide. Uh, this meeting is uh, concurrently being translated into Spanish. So to access the Spanish interpretation line, you can call 669-900-9128, followed by the hashtag or pound sign. And when asked for the meeting ID, please dial in 542 334 one seven three and then followed by the pound sign scott please advance the next slide there are two ways to participate during this meeting um, to speak you can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon that you have on your control panel and if you would like to uh, submit your questions and comments in writing you can do that as well by typing in on the question dialog box on the control panel. So those are the two ways that you can participate during the questions and, uh, and answer discussion part of this meeting. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn over the presentation over to Vernie Coverhall. Vernie is a principal planner with the city, and he is the project planner for the comprehensive general plan update. Thank you. Vernie? Yes, um, good evening everyone and thank you Min for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, welcome. My name is Vernie Carvajal as Min said and I'm here this evening to provide you with a brief overview on where we're at today in regards to this general plan since this process began back in 2015. First off, I want to thank our participants who registered um, and are joining us here today. I know it's a busy time for everyone and wanted to thank you for your time in advance. As many of you received um, either electronically or in the mail, there was a flyer distributed with some information on how to register. The, the flyer itself included the goal for our meeting today or some of our goals. Well, and I want to cover some of those. We'd like to discuss where we are today, as Min mentioned, in terms of our update, discuss our prime objectives for the plan, provide an overview of new topics and major changes, and then move on to next steps. As Min mentioned, this um, webinar is being broadcast in, in English. However, we do have simultaneous Spanish translation available, so I will be speaking slowly to allow for Margarita Macedonio, who's been gracious enough to uh, translate for us this evening, um, to make sure she's keeping folks um, up to speed. As Min also mentioned, there will be a short break during the presentation to allow for discussion, and then followed by another question and answer session following the entire presentation. With that, with that, Scott, I'd ask if you can advance to the next slide, please. As many of you are aware, the general plan is one of the most important policy documents towards achieving our community's vision for the future. So this is a very exciting time for the city. In this case, the new general plan provides a long range tool that sets forth goals, policies and programs to guide the implementation of our new vision. Our new vision being the golden city beyond. As required by the state, there are seven required elements as um, per this slide, land use, circulation, 
housing, conservation, open space, noise, and lastly, safety. The housing element will be following uh, the general plan as is required by the state to be updated. One other item um, of mention that as of 2018, the topic of environmental justice is a, is a requirement by the state of California for all general plans moving forward. The city is aware and cognizant of that and is committed to environmental justice throughout our document. With that, I've asked Scott to advance to the next slide, please. So one of the things I wanted to describe was how the general plan as a tool can be used to implement the city's vision. There's a few bullet points here, but as I stated, the general plan means something very general. It has goals and policies that are used to implement specific um, activities that the city wishes to pursue or that the residents wish, would like to pursue. Once adopted, the city council and the new general plan could then influence future plans that would help us implement those goals and policies. Some examples are uh, capital projects, a parks master plan to identify new park locations, and simply a, our, our zoning code update, which is due for uh, long overdue for an update, which includes provisions for parking, open space, and actual development standards. Scott, the next slide, please. <coughs> This slide here shows that in addition to evaluating data, the city made a cognizant effort since 2015 to reach out to dozens of residents and key stakeholders throughout the city over the past five years. This includes the formation of a general plan advisory group, coordination with um, groups such as Comlink, consultation with neighborhood associations in, environment, in environmental justice areas, discussions and exercises with youth programs and our youth commission, outreach to members of the business community, and communication with community-based organizations and coalitions. Next slide, please. These early outreach efforts resulted in key takeaways as part of the formation of the plan that we have today. The community was clear in that our new plan should protect and enhance our existing cities, historic and cultural assets, create a land use pattern of active and healthy lifestyles, ensure equitable distribution of our resources, focus in on sustainable and a livable city, and then education and economic prosperity cannot be left behind. Our next slide, please. By protecting these assets and addressing our priorities, the new general plan aims to be a working document that is streamlined, unlike the last general plan that was updated last in 1982, as Min mentioned. It will be easy to use and comprised of 12 new elements that we have on this slide. I will go over them with you once again, land use, urban design, historic preservation, economic prosperity, open space, conservation, safety, public services, noise, our community, mobility or circulation, and housing to be followed shortly. The plan is based upon these five core values that are outlined below, which will hold each goal and policy accountable to our key com community pillars of culture, sustainability, health, education, and equity. Next slide, please. This um, provides a little roadmap of where we've been over the last five years, and the plan has become what it is today, following a multi-year community outreach program that we worked so hard to, um, to um, provide for the community and each of the stakeholders, residents, and our businesses. We've, we've attempted to reach out to our seniors and our youth, which represent our city's future. Ongoing feedback has been provided by our city council along each step in the process. So as you see, 2015 outlined some of the early outreach. We, we began this plan with actual outreach and listening to the community. We delivered that outreach plan to our city council and then further distilled it in 2017 with our advisory group. In 2018, we provided um, some recognition for the, the folks that spent over a year processing the information that the city had collected. 
and then held study sessions uh, with various uh, stakeholders and then pop-up events throughout the city. Finally, delivering a package to our city council in 2018, which was the first basis of a draft general plan. And that is known as the policy framework, which I hope some of you have had the opportunity to review. In 2019, we turned our attention to land use alternatives and started looking at the focus areas in greater detail. Went out to the community and surveyed our community first, then took that information back and shared with our elected officials in one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, sat down with staff and other stakeholders to uh, arrive at the plan that we have today. Moving forward in 2020, we began the year by starting our environmental documentation by releasing the NOP. And we are uh, in a process now to uh, attempt at um, completing this document by the year's end. Next slide, please. I want to be very frank in that this is a very ambitious schedule, I understand. But I wanted to make clear what we have available for the public today to review. It took us a while to get here. And as I mentioned, the first glimpse of our general plan was presented and affirmed back in 2018 by our city council, where staff presented the plan on behalf of our community, including our vision statement, core values, some draft maps, some early draft maps, and our goals and policies, which have been further refined, but the, uh, the, the, the bones of those goals and policies remain the same. This work was created by the community and the hard work of the general plan advisory group. This then was followed by that citywide land use workshop. And then in February of this year, as I mentioned, the environmental process began. There was an early commitment to environmental justice to our community and through our core values of equity and health, which were formulated way back in 2016. And then later those were confirmed through SB 1000 as required by the state. The plan intends to include these policies throughout the document versus a standalone document that didn't really cross reference each of the required documents. And the, the city staff wanted to take that step a step further and outline specifically where throughout the document in June, we released the policy summary, which is now available on our website and I encourage you to each um, review. Next slide, please. All right, so the next slide here um, discusses a key topic of SB 1000, which is environmental justice. Cities and counties have to update public policies for disadvantaged communities in order to accomplish and, and must reduce unique or compound health risks, promote civil engagement in the decision-making process, and prioritize improvements in these key areas. These areas that you see on your slide before you are highlighted in purple and they represent areas of high risk of exposure to either pollution in the air, water, soil. And those things are then further compounded by other socioeconomic and health issues. Needless to say, there are 17, uh, 17 census tracts throughout our city, which represents a large portion of our city that are considered disadvantaged. Due to COVID and some of the current health crisis, the general plan team was faced with a new challenge on engagement with our community. We really wanted to do a good job and reach out to our environmental justice areas. So we produced an informational flyer as soon as possible, to, followed by an informational online e-learning tool to describe the key considerations and the hard work that we're doing in the area of environmental justice. These flyers uh, were about 54,000, which we, which we were, mail, which mail, were mailed out in May of this year. And then this workshop flyer that um, you all received as a result of tonight's meeting was published and sent out to over 22,000 residents within 500 feet of affected focus areas. The city remains committed to incorporation of these environmental justice policies throughout our general plan. Now, at first glance, it appears that over 135 policies are directly related to environmental justice and are a result of some of the initial stake stakeholder feedback that we received from um, some other folks in the city doing great work. 74 of these speak directly to our core values of equity and health. Next slide, please. The next series of slides is gonna cover what we promised to provide you this evening, which is a summary of key topics that emerged throughout uh, our process. The first of which is environmental justice. And I wanted to cover kind of an overview of what we heard. Folks are really concerned with particulate matter such as waste recycling, 
having access to LT Foods, continuing to um, be part of the civic engagement process, to have safe and sanitary housing, and then get, getting rid of conflicting and incompatible land uses, such as industrial and residential interfaces. The new community element will serve to address some of those concerns that I mentioned in our key policies. And then we continue to stress the importance of health as our core value. Next slide, please. But further, instead of going over just goals and policies, I wanted to read a few to you so you understood kind of where we're at, where we're at with some of these. So first, I wanted to share with you is related to hazardous and polluting uses, and that is in our land use element, where we intend to improve the health of residents, students, and workers by limiting the operation of noxious, hazardous, dangerous, and polluting uses that are in close proximity to sensitive receptors, such, were, such as were identified by our com community, and give priority to those to give it to, to discontinuing, discontinuing, excuse me, those uses in environmental justice areas. Next slide, please. Another example would be uh, a potential action. So there are goals, there are policies, and then there are, what are you gonna do about that? Which is called an action, potential action. We need to collaborate with residents and industry stakeholders to create incentives and an actual amortization program to relocate these existing heavy industrial uses to sensitive uses such as residential. So this is a commitment that the city together with um, what we heard is, is ready to move forward with. Next slide, please. So the next slide covers a new topic. Another topic that came and was a resounding concern deals with health and wellness, access to safe and healthy food, access to community centers for our residents, mobility options for all ranges of ages and abilities, and then access to public spaces and open parks. Our community element, again, is where this information will be housed, again, referencing health as a core value. Next slide. An example of a policy for recreation would be to promote the development and use of municipal buildings, such as City Hall, for example, indoor facilities, sports fields, sports fields through joint use efforts, for example, and outdoor spaces for recreation that serves residents throughout the city. Again, giving priority to those areas that are in our EJ area boundaries. Next slide, please. Another potential action that we could consider in the topic of health and wellness would be to coordinate with directly with community residents, other stakeholders to potentially identify vacant underutilized properties and strategize together on how these properties could be repurposed into public parks or commercial recreation facilities. These are things that we're actively looking to do. Next slide, please. Here we a new topic, and it's a very exciting one. We took this topic to our Historic Resources Commission last night, and I'm happy to say, for the first time in our city's history, we're committing to historic preservation with our first historic element historic preservation element. Folks were very adamant about preserving our architectural heritage and our sites, uh, ensuring new development respects uh, our existing community, maintaining our unique character and preserving the buildings within our city. This historic preservation element will ensure that we preserve not only our historic resources, but our valuable cultural assets, murals, locations that are either public or private. I know last night they talked about preserving a, a historic fire station, for example, and a mural at City Hall. These are, all, these are all topics that would be covered potentially as actions in our historic preservation element. Next slide, please. This image is of our, our a public downtown breakfast that occurred years ago. And through a policy of our, of preserving our historic districts through design standards. We'd like to explore opportunities to preserve our neighborhoods by keeping these intact historic buildings in place and preserving their character through the creation of historic districts, such as historically sensitive neighborhoods or through specific design standards that guide residents um, through architectural features of their home that they would, would and should preserve in order to preserve our integrity. Next slide, please. A potential action could be to preserve, to present a public realm plan within these historic districts, which includes historically relevant landscaping, sidewalk lighting, 
curb cut standards and pedestrian amenities to help highlight these key historical places. With that, we move to a new topical area of community empowerment. These days, there has been a lot of um, news related to social justice and empowerment of our community. We heard this back in 2016, that the community wanted to increase their participation. The Sunshine Ordinance, all the previous wins of the community have allowed them to be part of this inclusive public policy making, include and increase our communication through community outreach to non-English speaking communities. Throughout our general plan process, we attempted to make sure that all of our documents were available in English and Spanish, as well as uh, providing simultaneous, simultaneous uh, translation where feasible, um, such as this evening. Some proposed changes to policy would be to build upon this collaboration and strengthen neighborhood identity through urban design and preservation. Next slide, please. This image um, captures some of our earlier outreach um, efforts where some members of the community came and spoke up about what they liked and didn't like about our community. This is an example of where we empowered our community to facilitate their community engagement and dialogue in our policy decisions, such as in this general plan, and resulting in positive outcomes which would affect land use and development for the future. Next slide. A potential action in this area would, strengthen, would continue to strength, strengthen these partnerships with our local organizations and enhance engagement strategies and identify ways to overcome obstacles that we currently face for engagement. A good example of that is our current health pandemic, presenting a sort of an obstacle to get and reach out to our community. The general plan team has worked hard to try to maintain momentum over the past five years and with this new challenge, um, as I mentioned through our, um, our environmental justice outreach, we needed to retool and reinvent ourselves to try to get the message and the word out. Tonight's presentation is another good example of how we're trying to um, reach other residents that typically may not be able to join a, a public meeting, but are able to join us either through a smartphone or at home. Next slide, please. Lastly, through, um, lastly our, uh, another um, issue of concern or identification was alternative transportation options. How do we create a safer environment for both our pedestrians, our cyclists, ensure that our sidewalks and curbs are ADA accessible for our future seniors and our current senior community? How do we plan for and provide walkable neighborhoods? And I want to go back a little bit and talk about um, ADA accessible. This doesn't um, deal with our senior community, but you know, different portions of our community that might have special needs or have physical uh, disabilities, um, those are part of that community as well. Lastly, we want to uh, improve our safety and connections to our transit system. And this is going to be part of a new and updated circulation element that has been ongoing for the past uh, I don't know, eight or nine years now, finally is landing um, concurrently with the general plan update. So we're excited about creating a multimodal circulation system that starts to link these key areas. Next slide, please. Some examples are uh, creating complete streets, transforming travel ways to accommodate all users, as I mentioned, through design amenities such as sidewalks, trees, landscaping, and street furniture to make our streets more lively, more active, and uh, more attractive to our visitors and to our residents. Next slide, please. Some potential actions could be to um, conduct an actual study of the existing street networks to identify which streets could be more complete. Some of this work has already been completed and the city is looking at preparing and submitting recommendations to the city council on a priority list of areas where we could make some of these improvements. Next slide, please. Another key topic, and I know I'm covering a lot of ground here. As you see, the general plan reaches almost every portion of the community from safety to parks to land use. And so what we're trying to do is cover some key highlights of our plan. Next, the topic of equitable parks and recreation starts to talk about our community centers, libraries, how we can make connections between our actual population and the facilities 
that are going to be in place to serve our populations. It's been very clear that there are not enough parks or open space spaces throughout our city and, and the need for additional programming and safer and more, maintain, more maintenance at our, our parks and existing open space areas. There should be a greater emphasis to city policy. I'm pleased to say that as part of, of this plan, um, we've corresponded with our parks, parks agency and there, there is an upcoming parks and master plan that hopes to identify specific deficiencies and locations of public parks. An open space element as part of this general plan, the land use element, the community element, and the public service element all have policies that speak directly to some of these concerns. Next slide, please. For example, policy, a policy found in the open space element could be to create and maintain, ensure that our residents get access to a parks master plan and that they're part of the process to incorporate data on the need, demographics, and health outcomes. Next slide, please. A potential action could be to review and amend ordinances to require sufficient park dedications or additional in lieu fees to meet this open space requirement as outlined in our general plan and master plan. Currently, I believe it's two acres for 1,000 residents. And I think our goal is to maintain that two per thousand and looking at opportunities for additional parks and open space and joint use efforts. Next slide, please. On the topic of economic prosperity, as with COVID, there's been some strain to our local businesses and our community. How do we continue to attract businesses that provide not only new jobs, but community benefits um, outside of just the tax revenue? How do we distribute this funding um, for the improvements citywide? How do we capitalize on our prime location as a city of Santa Ana, adjacent to uh, a regional airport with, with John Wayne? Um, our existing uh, UCI and local universities, Santa Ana College, our resorts in the city of Anaheim and destinations along the 55 freeway as serves as a prime corridor in the intersection there with the five freeway, how we can invest in additional programming as well to assist low income residents. Policies have been um, written to create a stronger emphasis. Apologize for that uh, typo there. Should be emphasis versus emphasize. Uh, our existing businesses facilitate investment and improve the health of and image of our city. Next slide, please. To give you an example, um, one of our policies in our economic prosperity element would be to support community-based economic development initiatives, such as a buy local campaign, marketing strategies, and work worker cooperatives. Next slide. And speaking about some uh, potential, poly, um, potential implementation actions, uh, we could, or additional policies, we can partner with the Chamber of Commerce, other local business organizations, and college businesses. And next slide, please. Our next slide is a transition slide. I wanted to pause there because we've created, uh, we've actually covered quite a bit of ground here. I wanted to pause for the opportunity for some questions and answers and allow the public to weigh in on some of these glimpses of our future plan. So with that, I'll turn it over to staff to identify any written or um, phone uh, communication that we've received and, and questions that we might be able to field. Bernie, this is Melanie McCann, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So we've had a couple of questions regarding SB 1000, and one in particular is um, just confirming that we will be addressing it not as a separate element, but as integrated in all of our elements. And then uh, the question, one specific question is, um, how will we integrate it with pollution mitigation in the general plan? All right, I, I didn't get a name, but thank you for the question. That is that was, correct. Go ahead. That was from Adolfo Sierra. Adolfo Sierra, um, the name uh, sounds familiar. Thank you for your commitment to environmental justice. 
We know you've been active in the community and organizing um, members of the community to speak on behalf of environmental justice. So I wanna thank you for your hard work. Um, the topic of environmental justice will be covered throughout the general plan. The state uh, allows for two options. The first being introducing a new general plan element, which would stand alone, or option two, which would be to create policies throughout all general plan elements. We were in a prime position as a city since we were doing a comprehensive general plan to ensure that all general plan elements included policies and goals related to environmental justice. So that is the option that we chose. And I think the second part of the question there spoke to just pollution. As I mentioned earlier, the general plan has policies and goals that are a bit uh, general, if you will, but implementation actions that could sp speak specifically to pollution are, are, um, are being drafted as we speak. And you know, I think it's something that we need to make sure that is included. Thank you. Anyone that would like to specifically ask a question live, if they could um, raise their hand in the chat mode and we'll be happy to unmute your connection. Is there anyone that would like to speak for themselves? If not, then we can go on to one of the other questions that's been uh, typed in. Uh, someone was wanting to better understand the, the platform that we're using and, uh, why, and um, why they can't see the other uh, people's questions. So, Melanie, I raised my hand a couple of times. Well, very good. It's not showing on there. It's not showing on ours. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, my name is Jose Rea, and my question is, uh, Brastic came to Saudi Santana in 2017, and it's a metal plating uh, company that is releasing a lot of chemical and harmful vapors and particular matter in a very close proximity to apartments, uh, Kennedy Elementary, Madison Elementary, and Century uh, uh, High School. Um, what did the city do to prevent this company to be just a few yards from the apartments, less than a thousand yards from two, three schools. Uh, what do you do to prevent that? You know, uh, because that's that was really the type of things that we do not need in the community. That's environmental injustice. All right, Mr. Rea, um, good evening. Thank you for your question. Um, your specific concern has to do with um, new uses that were recently approved that are causing undue harm to the community and what this general plan could do to help curb that situation now and potentially in the future. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So the general plan um, speaks to looking at, as I mentioned, through potentially creating implementation actions that could amortize um, specific uses that are creating undue harm to the community, and that's A. Um, so through the zoning code update, we could also start to look at the types of uses through uh, a more cautious kind of eye and only allow those uses that are light or very light industrial to continue to be approved within these um, areas. Um, there could be things as uh, required buffers, for example, from sensitive receptors. A sensitive receptor is like a, a residential use or a school, for example. So those are two, um, two potential actions that we could take. Now, uh, to address your issue on, on what could happen to an existing use, well, um, as you know, some of the uses are permitted by right today are, are based on our existing zoning code. And those are considered legal non-conforming. Um, but that does not to say that we can't look at opportunities to partner with regulatory organizations. And, and I know it's not related to, um, to water contamination, but I'll use air quality through A2MD collaboration. I know the city's done some great work, Scott and his team through neighborhood initiatives has begun to uh, 
uh, start the conversation. But you know, the city taking on a greater role as a mediator between the residents and the and the and the actual organization to to reach a, a, a solution more quickly uh, and more directly would be the intent of these goals and policies that hopefully will become implement implementation. Yes, I'd like to uh, ask a question. This is Diane Fradkin. Hi, 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 Diane. How are you? Hi, is this Barney? This is Vernie, yes. Okay, hi, Vernie. Um, hey, I wanted to just uh, say that I appreciated seeing your comments addressing um, historic resources and uh, the open space issues, parkland and open space issues. When will we see more detailed uh, information on those two items? Well, thank you for your question and your emails. I know you've also been very active uh, throughout the process, so I get your input. Um, our elements in our environmental documentation is going to be released early this month. So I know uh, we're looking at posting more details and actual elements beginning as early as next week for the public to uh, review and comment on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions, uh, Melanie, that we have coming through? I have a question. Thank you. May I? Yes, yes please just go ahead. Kind of state your name, please. Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Carla Juarez, and I live in Santa Ana, longtime resident. And so, one of the concerns that I have is not knowing uh, what uh, material or waste material is around my neighborhood. I live in Hedinger Park, and um, I want, I want, what I want is something now. Like it, uh, especially transparency. I want to be able to know uh, what manufacturing company around my neighborhood, because I am part of the affected neighborhood, um, and what they're doing and what waste they're causing, and what impact has had it had on on my community specifically. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Carlo, for your question. Um, Henninger Park is a, is a beautiful neighborhood, and thank you for joining the, the conversation uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to turn this question over to, to Melanie, who, who's been working closely on, on obtaining some of that information in collaboration with Neighborhood Initiative. So I'm not sure, Melanie, or Scott, or Margarita, you can speak to this specific question. I know we have some technical documents, Carla, as part of our, our, our environmental review process that you might be able to reference here shortly. I will give you some specifics on some of those studies. Um, but to speak to existing businesses, I'll turn that over to Melanie and or Scott's uh, team. I, this is Melanie McCann. I can start to address that. Uh, we are um, working to get an inventory of the various um, businesses that require permits for AQMD, um, that require permits from the health um, organizations and to get a better handle on um, those types of businesses that are in the city and so that'll be an effort that will uh, be working collaboratively with other agencies and I know Madison Park has and their organization has done some good work in that area as well so we're, we're looking to pull together our resources and our the other organizations and get a better sense of um, all the different businesses in town that might have some um, potential hazard um, conditions to affect the residents. Carla, did that uh, answer your question completely? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you. And, um, it, it, I mean, it sort of, it sort of did, uh, but at the same time, uh, I'm still like uh, left empty handed. I still don't know Sure. Um, and especially so, now because it's um it's already July and I know that the general plan is to be like 
wrapped up by the end of this year, and I still don't know. Um, so I think it's it's Bernie? not enough time. Go ahead, Melanie. If I might comment, what the 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 thing that you're asking about is what we would call an implementation action. It's something, and implementation actions are things that we would follow up to achieve our goal. So if our goal and policy is to um, reduce those hazardous hazardous uses and those negative impacts on residents, that's our goal and our policy to do that. The actions take time. And it's not part of something that's going to be done in the next month or two. Um, it's something that needs to be prioritized. And it's a, if you will, it's a follow-up action. But having said that, I would be happy to work with you um, and connect with you later to uh, keep you involved in the research that we have so far. And maybe we can look specifically in your area uh, sooner than later. Thank you. And I'm so sorry. I just wrote down your first name. Can I have it or uh, can you connect me? Melanie McCann, M-C-C-A-N-N. -N. And you can um, email at the general plan uh, website if that's convenient, and I would be happy to get back to you and talk further. Thank you. Because I do appreciate you trying to help out um, specifically me and my family, uh, which uh, all three of my family members have asthma, which I, I thought was just genetics. But it could be a lot more than just genetics. Um, but, uh, but I also have lots of friends and family around Santa Ana as well that don't live in Hedinger, that live in Artesia Park, that live all around Santa Ana. So I know that they're also affected as well. Uh, but thank you. I'll follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Carla. Uh, Melanie, are there any other um, questions? Tengo una pregunta. Mi nombre es, uh, perdón. Uh, mi nombre es Adolfo Sierra, soy el presidente de la asociación de Madison Park y estoy hablando en español porque quería, quería asegurarme y, y gracias a los presentadores por tenernos el día de hoy aquí y también a los uh, participantes. Uh, quisiera saber si están haciendo la traducción la y interpretación uh, simultánea en español porque creo que una de las uh, peticiones que hemos hecho es de que haya este tipo de presentaciones de parte de la ciudad con relación al plan general, específicamente en lo que es uh, justicia ambiental en varios idiomas. Uh, específicamente uno de ellos es en español porque la mayoría uh, de personas que vivimos en la ciudad de Santa Ana hablamos español, una gran, un gran porcentaje, pero también hay algunas otras uh, uh, comunidades que hablan este, otros idiomas como los vietnamitas, a los a, a, camboyanos, etcétera. Entonces, uh, quisiera nada más asegurarme que estamos uh, llegando o ustedes están proveyendo este tipo de información a la mayoría de la comunidad en su idioma. Gracias. Thank you, Adolfo. I'm going to go ahead and translate um, a little bit uh, in Spanish after I respond. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes, Adolfo, por su comentario. Quería asegurarle que um, la información sobre uh, justicia ambiental lo intentamos, um, uh, intentamos tener en los idiomas de español e inglés por lo pronto y nuestras formas están disponibles en varios idiomas. Tenemos traductores uh, disponibles para los para las idiomas que tendremos uh, a los que estarán interesados y quería darle las gracias por sus comentarios hoy día y los que ha entregado por correo electrónico. Sí. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you. I just wanted to quickly uh, summarize. Um, the question had to do with whether or not there were translation services available in various languages as part of the general plan update process. And I assured uh, Mr. Adolfo Sierra, who was speaking Spanish, that our presentations have been translated where feasible in both languages 
and most of our communication has been available in multilingual um, options. For example, our PowerPoint presentation uh, was narrated not only in English, but also in Spanish and available uh, in text format for those that might be either hearing impaired or have some sort of other disability. Um, at this point, we'll take another question and thank you for your time. I have a question, a follow-up question to Adolfo Sierra's uh, question earlier um, regarding um, language access and interpretation. My question is not just about whether the um, interpreting services are being provided from English to other languages, and it appears that currently it's only being provided to Spanish, but um, the first part of my question is, is it being provided in the other direction? So are people who speak other languages who are taking time out of their days to prepare public comments, to prepare questions for you, to engage in these public meetings um, in languages other than English, how can they be assured that their information is being translated professionally and not on the fly by current panelists? Um, I would like to know if the two languages can be provided on the same platform so that people don't have to register for a meeting and go to webinar, find out at the beginning of the meeting that they're actually supposed to call in via Zoom. Um, and if they happen to miss that slide, miss the entire first portion of uh, this presentation before they can actually call in and make their points. So it's a, partly a question and also a comment that not only does the translation have to be in um, multiple directions, so people who speak Vietnamese, Spanish, Cambodian, other major languages in the areas that are most directly affected by these issues, um, that these languages are being translated to um, city staff members and also in the other direction, that these happen in the same platform so that speakers of all languages can be engaged in the same conversation, um, and that the slides themselves for these meetings be translated in advance. This happens in environmental justice processes across the United States, across California. It is a key element of SB 1000 that civic engagement be accessible to those most impacted by these issues. Um, and so it's partly a question about what you're going to do about it, but it's an, also a comment that this needs to be addressed immediately before further community outreach. And my name is Katie Cox. I'm a volunteer um, in Madison Park and a PhD candidate studying environmental justice at UC Irvine. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, and uh, Go and Eaters, uh, UCI graduate as well. Um, your points are, are taken uh, not lightly. We are evolving through this process and are learning from other jurisdictions on how they're dealing with not only COVID, but also in trying to be compliant, 100% compliant with the regulations of SB 1000. Santa Ana is a very diverse community, as you know, and the city takes um, this very seriously. We, uh, we make every attempt at trying to provide translation services uh, whenever asked, but uh, your comment had to do with taking it one step further. And you know, in the future, I, I absolutely think that would be a great idea to look at the potential for simultaneous uh, presentations in either language as requested. Um, one thing I did want to say um, on that note is in, in 2016, as part of our executive summary, many of our residents provided commentary in Spanish. And if you go through the document, you'll see references to where we say translated from Spanish to English. So that information was absolutely included as part of our outreach. And we should definitely do a better job at um, you know, maybe expanding that um, uh, availability. But thank you for your comment. Hello, uh, this, this is Dale Helping. And evidently, I have uh, a lot of feedback here. Oh, sorry about that. Um, my question My question is, uh, the, this is a comprehensive update, yet the focus areas only show changes of land use to urban neighborhoods. Uh, I think it should be showing proposed areas for open space as well. And I was just wondering, will the master plan be completed prior to the general plan update? Master park plan, that is. Um, Dale, thank you for your comment. At this time, the general plan helps to set the stage for a future parks and master plan to be implemented. So to answer your question, it will not be. It's 
the general plan is intending to move uh, ahead of the parks master plan, but ensure that there would be an open space master plan created and by whom and when, by when. One of the things I want to state is that um, the second part of this presentation is going to deal with land use changes. So I might ask if you could reserve some of your comments on the land use focus areas until you know, we provide that portion of the presentation. Thank you for your comments. All right, um, I think at this time, um, what I'd like to do is move on. There is gonna be an opportunity, as I mentioned, to, can everyone help hear me okay? Yes. Yes. All right, um, what I'd like to do is continue um, our presentation here this evening to, to get into some of these key focus area uh, discussions. And so um, what I'd like to do is advance the slide. And um, Scott, if you would just remind folks how they could uh, participate. All right, let's. Um, Mintai, um, so there are a couple ways to participate during this meeting. You can raise your hand as many of you have already done, but you can also ask questions uh, and continue input into the um, question dialogue and then to call in scott if you can advance to that slide and again to call in you can dial 669-900-9128 the meeting id is 542-334-173 followed by the hashtag pound sign. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. With that, we'll, um, we'll get started with the second portion of the presentation that has to do with uh, land use alternatives related to key focus areas throughout the city. As I mentioned earlier in our timeline, there were opportunities to present to the community in these key focus areas, um, some of the potential changes. There was a survey done, which was done on the city's website, broadcast citywide for comments, as there was individual focus area meetings that occurred throughout May and June, I believe, 2019. Additionally, um, information received from those surveys was taken and discussed one-on-one -on -one with city council members at city meetings and compared with general plan core values and regional goals. The results of that survey and the alternatives were, um, were compiled to create the project that you see before you that began and was shared with the public in February through the notice of preparation. Next slide, please. For those of you that may have not been involved with that process, I wanted to quickly go over the land use focus areas. But before we do that, I wanted to focus on the bottom portion of the slide in blue. Those existing focus area, not focus areas, those existing adopted planning areas are, are currently in place. And I'll start from left to right on the map. Um, it's, it's the harbor plan, harbor specific plan on your left there. It's 17th and harbor and, and, and continuing down south. We have uh, the Bristol Street corridor specific plan on the south there that terminates at Warner Avenue and goes up north to Memory Lane. The Midtown plan, which covers the Midtown area along Broadway and Main Street there near our Civic Center. And we have the recently adopted or uh, modified amended Metro East mixed use overlay zone on the east side on First Street. And then we have uh, a map of the main place specific plan, which completed the fourth specific plan at the city where there's new mixed use opportunities at main place. And then lastly, the transit zoning code that focuses um, some mixed use opportunities in our downtown. Now I'll uh, point your attention to the areas in I see the color is pink. 
but whatever uh, color you might see, it's the top of, of your screen that says focus areas. The first is South Main Street, but before we go over the focus areas, one thing I wanted to talk about was how these focus areas start to create linkages to our city's core. Past development proposals have been focused along the city's uh, perimeter and the periphery of the city. And there's been a lot, a lot of uh, discussion and lack of attention to the city's core. So this focus area plan intends to start to create linkages between not only adopted plan areas, but to our downtown and finding ways to create linkages between existing specific plans and proposed specific plans. The first being South Main Street, which would take um, first and Main Street, effectively down south to the Pacific Electric right of way and create um, a southerly extension of our downtown, um, which is currently um, bisected by First Street and, and create some opportunities for additional mixed use development there and revitalization of that area. The next focus area would be Grand Avenue and 17th Street. Initially, that uh, plan area was limited to the intersection of Grand and 17th. Uh, following a series of conversations with our council and um, with city staff, there was opportunities that we were uh, not capturing by not um, taking the plan northbound to the 22 freeway to make sure that we were um, regionally connecting to the 22 freeway and then southbound to our downtown. So that, that uh, focus area was slightly amended. The next is the West End and a Boulevard um, focus area that follows the path of the future Orange County streetcar that is in full swing. And then the next one is the 55 Freeway Dyer Road focus area. And I'll cover some of those objectives in those slides. It's on the bottom right of your screen. And then the last is the South Bristol uh, focus area, which effectively carries the momentum from Warner Avenue of the existing South Bristol plan down to the southerly city boundary to capitalize on some of the success of South Coast Plaza. So with that, I'm going to move to the next slide, please, and we're going to get into some specifics, which I know a lot of folks are looking, um, are interested in hearing about. So the first um, slide here in our focus area discussion uh, takes us to South Main Street, and I wanted to go over some of the objectives uh, for South Main to facilitate redevelopment and property improvements along the Main Street corridor, uh, to create more active and dynamic streetscapes. There was, a, um, there was a study commissioned by an architectural firm by the name of Gensler that created um, some opportunities for public realm improvement plans. So we wanted to take some of that momentum and start thinking about ways to comprehensively create some more multi-story frontages along the corridor and try to support transit, pedestrian, and non-motorized travel there. Next slide, please. All right, so this plan shows what we have um, looked at and studied in draft form. I wanna remind our, our viewers and our listeners that this is a draft land use plan. It's not adopted, it's not being adopted tonight. This is up for discussion. Um, there will be opportunities to speak on or comment on these focus areas at upcoming meetings that we're going to highlight here in the presentation. So in yellow generally is our low density residential area. The intent with this plan is to preserve those low density uses. This is one of our highly, highest density and densest portion of the city. And what we wanted to do is take those buildings on Main Street specifically and try to preserve um, many of those buildings with the opportunity to add additional urban neighborhood, low density urban projects, either behind those existing buildings or amongst the fabric of South Main to revitalize it. The other important takeaway from South Main is to, and speaking to Mr. Correa's comment about um, nox noxious uses, is how can we clean up our industrial land uses so our intent here is to create a new designation called in industrial flex, um, allowing more office industrial flex spaces, cleaner industrial, some small scale R&D maker uh, spaces, and some clean manufacturing. 
what we wanted to do on the next slide is to provide you a context here um, of the overall context of the, of, the, of the focus area. This is taken at, I believe it's the southeast corner of Broadway and Warner Avenue. Someone can jump in if, if I'm incorrect, but I believe this is Broadway and Warner Avenue. And I wanna show you the potential of an industrial flex on this property through uh, an illustration. The next slide, please. So this slide shows you um, the potential redevelopment of an industrial space with a cleaner uh, industrial flex uh, designation. You see in the background there, there's some opportunities for creative uh, live work, as well as some additional shopkeeper type of units on a multi-story area to maximize the use of that um, property, for example. And I'll take the next slide as we move on to the next focus area. As I mentioned, um, Grand and 17th began as a, a commercial node at the intersection generally of 17th and Grand. The intent was to create mixed use corridors and urban villages here to realize a more intense multi-storage frontage along the corridor. Um, for those of you that don't know 17th and Grand, we have uh, many single story 1970s style uh, retail that are being impacted not only now, but before uh, COVID. Uh, with underperforming storefronts and vacant spaces. We wanted to pro promote additional infill development here while being respectful of established neighborhoods, fostering community space and developing opportunities for small scale manufacturing in some um, flex areas as well, and maintain compatible nodes of commercial activity. So with the next slide, here we see some potential land use, land use designations um, I know there's been questions about the land use designation, and I want to clarify the difference between a land use and a zoning tool. This land use designation sets the framework for the potential land use of a site. Specific zoning standards would then mirror this land use and could be specifically to a parcel to ensure that there were not uh, compatibility issues, for example, once we got closer to residential. On the north side of the five freeway generally, um, you see urban neighborhood, which would be medium density at up to four stories in height. And then adjacent to that would be the continuation of general commercial, which exists there today. Adjacent to the railroad tracks, we wanted to clean up some of that light industrial by introducing here again, industrial flex with some clean R&D uses. And then south of the freeway, you'll see a darker, um, a darker purple color where we're looking at capitalizing on the location of our downtown and proximity to our downtown and its, its position as a gateway for some more intensive uses there with um, higher um, limits on height up to six stories. As I mentioned, zoning tools could help um, these DC um, land use properties to ensure there aren't compatibility issues with adjacent residential. Next slide, please. We wanted to do is uh, take a, a real um, image of a real interface between a commercial corridor and an existing neighborhood. This is north of 17th and Grand uh, at one of our um, secondary arterial streets uh, adjacent to a neighborhood. And the next slide shows the application of urban neighborhood in that context. As you see, the residential uses in the foreground would have a transition to the additional potential for the site, which would then be tiered back for a two or three story level with some additional commercial between that. Gives you a perspective of what could happen with a UN designation. Next slide, please. All right, next we're gonna to move to the West Santa Ana Boulevard focus area. This is adjacent to our proposed streetcar where we're looking at the potential for multi-story housing and more mixed use opportunities to capitalize on the transit adjacency, promote additional infill development and buffer industrial uses again with those residential neighborhoods. 
create some opportunities for clean industrial and maker spaces here, as well as on South Main, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. This creates a, a half a snapshot of the focus area plan. The next plan, the next page will cover the other portions. And so this is a east to west um, um, plan. Uh, we had to break it up into two slides. The different designations here that are being introduced are industrial flex again. And here we have the Willowick um, open space designation, which is not proposed to change at this time. We have the introduction of industrial flex areas, which were previously light or heavy industrial along this corridor to try to maintain some um, improvement of industrial uses adjacent to some of our key residential um, neighborhoods and public and professional administrative offices as well here. Next slide, please. The other portion, I think we have a duplicate image here. All right. Um, so I apologize, this, this focus area is missing the other half of the focus area, but um, I want to um, cover it as, as if you were showing it here today. Um, the, the second portion of the, of the focus area would continue to our, our downtown, or I'm not sure if they were able to consolidate all in one. It looks like it, it might be the complete focus area here. I can't tell on this slide, but um, effectively it would serve to connect our downtown to the west end of the city using the streetcar stops. And on this plan, you see the, the little bluish gray squares. Those are identified stops for the streetcar. And as you see, the land uses of urban neighborhood would be characterized at those intersections to try to enhance the overall look and feel of the stops themselves. Next slide, please. All right, this is an illustration of one of the streets um, that runs north to south. Um, I believe it's third, and I can't remember the name of the other street, but it runs adjacent to Superior Market, Superior Market there, um, just north of First Street. Next slide, please. So here's an introduction of, industri in, of Flex Industrial on the left side of the image. And then what we wanted to try to show is the preservation of our single family fabric and how those two can kind of um, exist uh, concurrently and in the background there um, is the transition to the streetcar line and some additional two and three story elements which would be um, the work uh, potential along that corridor. Next slide please. The next focus area that we're going to cover tonight is the 55 and Dyer Road focus area. Recent projects such as the Heritage and the Bowery have been submitted outside of the current land use plan that is um, regulating the city's land use. So we wanted to take a careful look at whether or not those types of developments should proceed. We wanted before we reacted to projects is to look at the area as a whole. And some of the takeaways at some of our focus area workshops were how can we provide additional opportunities uh, and uh, adding additional intensity at the city's edge. One of the things I want to mention here is that this is a prime gateway to our city along the 55 freeway, which leads not only to the airport on the south and to our universities, but to the north, to our resorts and to the um, other connectors of major arterial highways. Other cities like Fountain Valley and Irvine have capitalized on the adjacency to freeways. So we felt it was important to identify the gateway, um, the gateway um, location here and allow for uh, multi-story offices and addi additional height to take advantage of our position economically, as well as to create um, some opportunities for live work not live work, but the living and working within the vicinity um, by, while still protecting our office and employment sector. 
maintaining our existing hotel circle and commercial uses in this area was also a valid um, issue. Next slide, please. So this slide speaks to the proposed land use changes. As I mentioned, the location of the 55 freeway, you see the introduction of industrial flex. This industrial flex designation is a little different than South Main Street or the streetcar line, for example, where this would be a higher, more intense industrial flex, R&D type of corporate headquarters zone, which would allow up to 10 stories in height along the freeway's edge. And then that would tear down to a district center land use, which would allow additional high density urban villages um, with the opportunity to live and work in the immediate vicinity. And then lastly, preserving areas adjacent to um, our hotel circle through the general commercial designation. And how can we enhance shopping, restaurants, entertainment through revised zoning um, standards in the future? The next slide shows um, kind of an isometric view of a freeway's view, freeway vantage point that shows kind of the context looking out to the cities of Tustin and unincorporated County of Orange. Next slide. So this image that we're looking at um, serves to show the potential for increased height along the freeway's edge to capitalize on that gateway uh, potential to brand our city as um, equally as important um, and more of a um, more of a leader in terms of corporate biotech uses that seem to be um, other businesses are being attracted to our city you know existing businesses such as Medtronic have recently moved to our town and what can we do from a land use perspective to attract more um, R&D and biotech professional uses to our city as well. Next slide, please. Our next land use focus area is the South Bristol Street focus area. As I mentioned previously, we wanted to capitalize on the success of the South Coast metro area and introduce some mixed use in urban villages. Um, a key term these days is experiential commercial which has more to do with just creating retail storefronts, but places that people want to go to to experience um, a destination, whether it's shopping, dining, um, and creating um, multi-story presence along this corridor. Again, trying to be respectful of adjacent neighborhoods that are low density. In our next slide, we'll try to cover some of that um, transition. So for South Bristol Street, there are essentially um, a few segments, uh, namely three. We're at Warner Avenue. Um, we were looking at the designation of urban neighborhood up to three stories in height with appropriate zoning to buffer our residential communities on either side of Warner Avenue, Warner and Alton Avenue. And then as we approach the city's boundary to the south, where existing district center is today. This is one of the areas within our city that has existing district center as a designation. So we wanted to expand upon that and look for the potential to improve, again, single story retail under utilized uh, shopping centers and developments or more than um, what they have today. And so creating a transition between Alton Avenue and MacArthur Boulevard at a height of um, five to 10 stories. And then as we approach MacArthur Boulevard and Sunflower Avenue near South Coast Plaza, wanted to pull from some of the context of the existing um, um, Segerstrom Hall, some of the prime office buildings that exist at our city's southerly boundary and look for opportunities to create a visual and a key gateway um, to make sure that folks know that they're entering the city of Santa Ana. So with that, um, I'll show you a few images. The first is located at, I believe this is uh, Kalen's Commons. I believe there's a, a Buffalo Wild Wings on the site here, as you see in the image. This is looking southeast 
towards South Coast Plaza, I'm sorry, towards the Siegerstrom Hall on the east side of the street. And this next image shows the highest uh, intensity, as I mentioned, on the south, which could help to kind of identify the potential again for the South Coast, um, South Bristol focus area. If I can get the next slide, please. So I'll kind of let uh, the viewers kind of take that in. It has um, a few of the buildings that existed in the prior image um, of a similar height and scale. So you can see the transition not only between the existing single story Buffalo Wild Wings in the foreground, but how these this potential development could fit within the scale and context of what's happening um, on our neighbors to the south. And next slide, please. All right, so that essentially concludes the land use focus area overview. Before we get to questions and answers, I wanted to cover a few key dates. As I mentioned, this is a draft general plan. This evening is not intended to provide uh, action. However, there is a few key things that are happening in the next several weeks that I wanted to highlight. A few of our callers had questions about specific technical reports um, related to environmental um, hazards, for example. Those will be found and distributed in an environmental impact report that will be released this coming Monday, August 3rd, for a 45-day review period. Comments received on this technical document will be accepted by city staff and will be responded to as they come in um, uh, based on the concern or question that they have on the technical document. So the environmental impact report is a separate parallel report to the general plan document that is intended to identify any potential impacts. With this potential um, change to land use and general plan as a whole against what we've what we've uh, demonstrated so you get a real live comparison of what the plan has uh, envisioned and what potential impacts that could have on the community from various different uh, subjects someone also asked about when the draft general plan policies and maps would be available those are going to be posted as early as um, next monday the third as well for the public to review in conjunction with the environmental report. And then I wanted to point your attention to upcoming city council study sessions, which are not adoption hearings, but additional opportunities to provide opinion and comment. We encourage you to attend these council sessions and come to them with your comments, whatever they might be, on August 18th for city council and a planning commission on August 24th. And then lastly, our projected timeline, as someone stated, is the fall of 2020. So there's still a few months away, and we intend to continue the dialogue through the process. That concludes my presentation this evening, and I'd like with that to open up um, for questions. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, this is Jose Rea. My wife had sent a question. We share in the screen, my wife and I, and we both have some comments that, uh, so I hope it's not a problem that we can share them uh, one after the other. Please do. Go ahead. My name Go is ahead, Mr. Rea. Uh, I'm going to speak first. Uh, my name is Christina Garcia Rea, and I'm a resident of Madison Park. I'm concerned with the timeline for drafting the city plan, given the pandemic, given the fact that our many of our residents do not have access to these types of meetings. Uh, that can be shown even with just the amount of children who don't have access to computers to get to school. The residents don't have access to computers to get to these meetings. We need to be able to give input, especially in regards to environmental justice. There's more than 42 companies in Santa Ana that require permits from AQMD because of their pollution. And something needs to be done about that. It, that is something that affects me personally. I have been told from my doctor that the reason that I developed asthma was because of environmental pollution. I was a teacher 
for 31 years and here in Santa Ana and the amount of children that had asthma increased every year. In addition, you stated that, um, that you did community outreach on the issue of environmental justice as soon as possible. And you yourself said that as soon as possible was in May of this year. That is too soon for you to proceed without getting more impact input from the community. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, uh, this is Jose Rea again. I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Jose Rea and I have been a resident of Santa Ana for 37 years. In the last 21, in the Madison Park neighborhood. During these 21 years, I have served as the neighborhood association president and currently I'm the treasurer. I'm requesting that the city of Santa Ana takes more time to draft the general plan regarding environmental justice. Thus far, the city has treated EJ as, as a second thought, nothing important, not worth to invest the time to learn from us, the residents suffering from breathing unhealthy air every day. After you provide, uh, after, after you include today's input into the draft schedule, more outreach meetings to revise the inclusion of environmental justice in the, in the plan as required for Senate Bill 1000. I don't understand you released the flyers in May, which was two months ago, and tomorrow on Monday the 3rd, you're releasing the draft. How are you going to include the input that you're receiving today from the community? Are you working all night, today, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday to make sure that those that, that input is going to be included on Monday? And SB 1000 requires the city of Santana to address the, the root causes of pollution in a meaningful way. So far, you've been talking about economic development in these corridors, nothing about environmental justice. I thought these two meetings today and tomorrow were about environmental justice and how you're gonna integrate it into the plan. How do you clean our, how do you plan to clean our city during the next 25 years? It, you know, in 25 years, I'm not going to be around. By my, I want my kids to stay in their home in Santana and to have a cleaner air to breathe. And I want you to tell us how you're going to plan to do that. And so make Santana a clean and healthy city. Stop bringing polluters that need permits from South Coast Air Quality, uh, Quality District and, and the city and the city that allows them to, to get us sick. You're getting us sick. You cutting the years of our lives. You know, if we move a few blocks away to Irvine, people live 10 years longer in average than us. Why? Because of the stuff that, that, that it, we're breathing every day. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Rayo. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation that we, we have included the discussion of our mental justice throughout our um, outreach efforts. The, the key uh, topic of environmental justice was not framed until early 2016 by the state, but before then we had identified several core values that speak directly to environmental justice, as I mentioned back in 2018 and the policies that speak directly to this topic. Your concerns are, are, uh, are valid and I think um, I encourage you to continue to to speak freely and openly with, uh, you know, with with the elected officials that are responsible for, you know, approving this plan, we uh, are taking the topic of environmental justice very seriously, and intend on creation of uh, measurable um, implementation actions that speak directly to some of your concerns. So I appreciate your feedback today. Bernie, this is Melanie. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Melanie. We are having technical difficulties with um, the folks that have requested to speak. We ask that everyone wait for their name to be read off before they uh, speak. Uh, normally, we can better control that, but it seems as though people are able to just freely speak, and, and then it's not necessarily um, for those that have been waiting the longest. So, um, Suzanne Sandoval, would be the next person uh, to ask a question. Hi, Suzanne. Yes. yes. 
Um, mi nombre, my name is Susana Sandoval. Soy residente aquí en Santana por 30 años. I'm a resident here for 30 years. Um, I do live in Wilshire Square and we collaborate very closely with Madison Park. I am the uh, chair for the advisory committee for the Madison Park Neighborhood Green Program. And I am very concerned when I review the, doc review the documents that have been published so far. And you talk about how it's gonna include goals, policies and action, but there's never any mention of accountability. What are the standards that you're gonna to use to measure what is placed in the document? And that's something that we've seen over many, many years when I think back of the five-year strategic plan that finished in 2019, I don't remember seeing, well, we did accomplish this, this, and this. We did not accomplish this for this reasons. So I think to know where we're going, we need to know what really have our problems been in making these true living documents that do speak to social justice, environmental justice. And also in one of the documents that I reviewed uh, from this general plan discussion was December 2019. And Mr. Carvajal, you had mentioned that um, the environmental justice has been since 2016 in discussion, but yet in the one document that I saw 218, the environmental, it was December 218, and the environmental justice element was not in that document. So I think the community, there's some real issues of trust because of timeframes, notification, and as Mrs. Rea and Mr. Rea said, really engaging the community that is equitable, that there is really justice. This is moving too, too fast, and we need to have better mechanisms to get the opinions of the community that are living and breathing the air, especially on the Southeast Corridor. There's lots and lots of neighborhoods, and those 40 plus buildings are toxins in the air. We're concerned about um, toxins in the water, in the air, in the soil, and our children are very sick in those areas. We have higher incidence of respiratory disease, as was mentioned, asthma compared with children that live in communities such as Irvine. So we can't wait for our children to keep getting sick. I would suggest that the companies that are now in existence, we need to start doing some environmental studies and put them in compliance um, with the standards that are healthy standards. Thank you. Ms. Sandoval, thank you for your comments. Um, one thing I'd like to kind of speak to is just the topic of implementation actions. Uh, in terms of a li living, breathing document, the, environment, the topic of actions would be, the, the document itself will, will create a series of implementation actions with measurable results as part of the general plan. But beyond that, as I mentioned, uh, implementation measures that go beyond that are zoning code updates and so forth that attempt at um, curbing some of the issues that have been brought up this evening. So I appreciate your, your comments and your concerns with the time. Um, um, they are taken. Vernie? Yes. This is Melanie McCann. The uh, Carla Juarez would be the next person in line for speaking. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, You're Carla. Sorry, first of all, it's outside. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing space. Um, this is um, very stressful for me. I am sure it's also as well for you guys. Um, I was not aware about the environmental justice. So like the beginning of this month, I also like to echo that we're definitely moving too fast. But at the same time, I also feel we're not moving fast enough. So people who are breathing in air that is not healthy, you're uh, pretty much, the city is pretty much asking for those people who are breathing in, uh, for me, um, to keep breathing toxic air while, while y'all figure it out. So it's kind of very disappointing, it's stressful, and this just adds on to the unhealthy environment that I live in, having to wait till y'all figure it out. Um, also, looking at the general plan, uh, which also, by the way, I consider myself a very active participant in the city of Santa Ana, and I am very surprised that I, this is the first, the beginning of July was the first I learned about the environmental justice and that I was living on, a, on an area that is, um, it's for air pollutants, land pollutants. I know it's, it's a rent burden, 
which is something that I've been um, advocate about for the residents that already live in Santa Ana uh, and living with rent burden. And in your general plan, I, I saw what looks like luxury housing, which is not something that will benefit the residents that already live. I'm sorry, I hear like noise in the background. So I don't know if somebody has to mute themselves so I could. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, what I saw that there is a very lack on the general plan is open green spaces. Speaking of like being in an unhealthy environment, one of the things that we like is open green spaces. I saw lots of buildings, lots of luxury homes, and not enough affordable, true affordable housing for the rent and burden residents that already live here. I see that the focus is creating transit into the city, but we have a homelessness problem. So what kind of transit are we creating? Who is it gonna benefit? And is it gonna benefit the residents already live in Santa Ana who already have a pile of issues that they're trying to live through? And uh, one last question, and I do not mean any disrespect, but hopefully you guys see where, where I'm coming from which is me breathing in the bad air and living on bad, bad soil, is, um, I mean, do, do you guys, do y'all live here? And if you, you do live here, do you live in some of these affected areas? Which is why when you hear people uh, speaking with passion, aggression, anger, um, distrust, and a broken heart is because this is their life on a daily basis, and this is what we're having to live with. So I do want to see some action, but not the approval of the general plan until people have been aware of what the issues are. Because I could, I can bet every single penny I have that there are many people, including my neighbors, that are not aware of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, when we're, I guess you have several comments. I'm not sure if there's a specific response to to each of them, but you know, I think your points are well taken. Uh, as I tried to highlight in the presentation this evening, there is a resounding comments related to open space and and public health. So uh, what we're doing at this time is evaluating um, our goals and policies to make sure that they're aligned with the concerns of the community, which is what we intended to do. And our goal is to kind of listen to the community right now and see where we might have missed the mark through this draft and encourage you to participate throughout the process and continue to attend meetings like this and meetings that are, um, you know, resulting in a, a, an actual action to, to voice your concern. Um, I do have family that live in the city. Uh, the majority of it does. And, you know, I take this topic very seriously. I... You know, I spend much of my my time here at the city. You know, we work here as well, so it's uh, it's a plan that we all um, you know are holding dear to our hearts and want to make right. So I appreciate your comments this evening. Bernie. Yes. The, ne the next speaker in line would be Cynthia Guerra. Hi, good evening, Cynthia. How are you? I'm good. I hope that everyone is well. Um, just taking what other folks have said. Thank you for opening up this space. Um, I do have a few points to raise, um, and, I'll, and I'll get through them. Um, I think the first one, and to echo, I think what everyone else has said, uh, uh, this feels like a very rushed timeline. Cynthia, you're just a little um, hard to hear. Can you get can closer you to the hear, mic? Yeah, can you hear me right now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So I think one of the things that we have is it's an extremely rushed timeline. I think um, it seems like it would be two more months before we are aiming to adopt the general plan. And that's just not really enough time to have enough community input. I don't think it's enough time the regular, you know, when we're not dealing with COVID, I think that's very short, even, you know, we weren't dealing with this, but even now with COVID, some of the residents that we work with, a lot of the residents, you know, my neighbors, or I live in Santana, my neighbors, 
people that we know, they have a hard time getting onto these, you know, community meetings and virtual meetings and navigating this. Not only that, but also understanding what we're presenting, right? So I think trying to pass something so substantial and so, I think, something that's going to affect us so much in long term during this time irresponsible to be honest and so I, I echo what other folks have said that it's not okay to try to pass this so I understand it, it, it's you're not necessarily the folk that control this timeline but I do hope that then you're advocating with this telling them now that there has been strong community pushback to to trying to to adopt this general plan during this time and I think this every person, honestly, every person that has come on here has echoed that, and every person that I have spoken to outside of here um, has echoed that. So I think it's really important to note that. Um, and I think that, you know, Carla mentioned, you know, that doesn't mean inaction, right? Like, I, I think the general plan is one thing, that doesn't mean that, that the city can, has to stop and, and not connect, I think the city's responsible to do so. Uh, and it's just take action to start addressing the PMS thing, it doesn't have to happen through the general plan. I think just, the general plan is too good to pass right now during this time. Uh, you know, development didn't stop in the city because we hadn't, div you know, addressed the, the general plan for the years. We all created specific, you know, um, the Harvard specific plan or the, the Navy specific plan. So definitely, you know, life in the city doesn't stop because the general plan hasn't been updated. I just think that action can be taken, but we can also take time to delay the general plan and extend that timeline. So I definitely want to echo that. Um, I, this is, I appreciate that the real site is not part of, um, it doesn't have any proposed zoning changes at the time, and I, I really hope that it does stay that way because I understand that this is a draft. Um, I that's true. Why, given why it was ever included right in this focus area, um, given as folks have mentioned, just the, the importance of open space, what it has does for air quality. What it does for people right now who need to social distance in overcrowded areas, like in overcrowded housing, that space to, to safely, you know, recreate, like have a recreational activity during this time, where you have to shelter in place, that's really important. So, um, not sure why it was ever included in a focus area. And also, if it's no proposed zoning changes on the site, why it has to be included at this time, like why it still has to be in it. So, I mean, for us, it was still more comfortable that it was not included at all within this focus area of the Western Panama Boulevard focus area. Um, but again, we continue to you know, to make sure that it was not in the building zone. Two more points. The other one is um, I don't I don't think I've seen anything on anti-displacement policies. So this is a policy document. Um, document and I think a lot of folks have mentioned this there seems to be a lot of higher end development whether it be you know market or luxury development and when I say market right that's essentially development for our community because so many of them are you know uh, lower income way below the, the orange county uh, in median income so yeah I didn't I didn't see any of that and I think that it's important that we do make the connection of environmental justice to um, to be sent to displacement policy because a lot of times because folks can't afford higher rents around them, they're either displaced to move to other cities or they have to be forced into overcrowded conditions. And so what does that you know look like? It looks um, it's harder. You have more sanitation issues, more you know um, not adequate housing because folks are forced into this. It's not that they choose to be forced into these conditions. So I think definitely addressing this and how all the development that is being proposed through this focus areas, how it's going to impact them, the community that already lives there. Like that needs to be addressed, um, and I haven't seen that. But I think my last point, and it's something that again, folks have mentioned, you know, this distrust. You know, unfortunately, you know, there's there's kind of like a history, right, of of, of that connection. You know, what we're seeing happen in our communities is folks are getting displaced. They have to deal with a lot of pollution issues, this environmental justice issues, environmental racism. So I guess what I'm wondering, and the direct question is also. Folks keep talking about the implementation phase as something separate from the general plan. Then I'm curious, what does that look like? What is what does it mean that implementation comes after the adoption of the general plan? Um, because what I would what I would mean to see, to be honest, is that we don't take the chance to make sure that we're addressing these issues. And later on, when we come to the what we're calling the implementation phase, where we say, well, it's not included in the general plan, so we can't do anything about it, or 
or you know it should have been brought up sooner. So I guess I I'm kind of confused as to what that connection is between sure. and, and and what that means. The of implementation and then this apparent face that's going to come afterwards um, and how implementation happens there because like if the community is engaged and wants to work with you on that, but but to me that's unclear how that process looks like. So um, I think that's it for me for today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Cynthia. We had a little bit of a feedback issue there, but I just kind of want to summarize. Uh, you had yeah. some concerns related to the adoption timeline, the, import the importance of environmental justice for those listeners that were having issues um, uh, hearing Cynthia. She had some concerns with the Willowick um, site being included as part of the focus area itself, overall quality type and quantity of the development that's going to occur in the focus area. And just the overall level of distrust between uh, the residents and uh, in the city at large. And then lastly, she had some comments related to implementation and how that worked together with the uh, work together with the general plan. So um, thank you for your comments on the timeline. Um, Willow was included, as you know, uh, in the focus area, as were many other parcels in the area, simply because, uh, you know, we had to draw a specific boundary. Many of the parcels within the, you know, in the focus areas aren't subject to change, but we wanted to show their correlation with uh, uh, immediate sensitive uses. So same, same thing with Willowick. Um, thank you for your comment on development impacts. And, you know, this tonight's meeting is an attempt to trying to create that trust with the community. Implementation is going to be handled concurrently with the general plan. So it's not going to come after. Uh, the public will have an opportunity to uh, provide input on actual implementation by whom and when. So we encourage you to continue to, to collaborate with city staff and your elected officials at, create, at uh, providing your commentary. Thank you, Cynthia. This is Melanie. We have a number of speakers that were waiting to speak. Uh, we'd like to ask everyone um, to be respectful of that and to keep your comments to no more than three minutes and we'll try and respond quickly as well so we can get allow as many people as we can to speak thank you the next speaker would be um, maria rubicava Hi, good evening maria yes maria go ahead Maria, we can't um, hear you if you're, you might be muted. Maria, you're muted. Self-muted. Uh, we could go on to the next speaker and then come yes. back to Maria. Okay, sorry. Um, I was oh, muted good. by the organizer. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, okay. good evening, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for the presentation and for, you know, taking the time on a Friday evening um, to present this to us. Um, really appreciate it. Um, just had a few comments. I agree with a lot of the previous comments that have been made in regards to just how fast this whole process feels and how, given with COVID, um, even, even aside from COVID, it felt very fast. But um, given COVID, you can't really, you know, have this be counted. So just to everybody who's out in the audience right now, I I do want to encourage you all to to do make those uh, concerns, raise them to to city council. As at the end of the day, they are they are the ones that are going to you know decide if, if we go ahead and implement that um, this year or until um, if we can hold off until next year. Um, and then just in regards to the plan, I do um, see a lot of the the high rise. Um, the the one next to Buffalo Wild Winds really scared me just because it seems very much not aligned with with what the layout of the city seems right now. Um, Bristol is a you know heavily transited city and so just seeing a lot of the industrial complex the mixed use and anything more than two to three stories tall um, and a lot of the 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 building team that they won't be uh, necessarily for affordable housing so I'm just uh, asking questions in regards to to traffic um, congestion to parking like if any of those uh, things have been taken into account because it seems that 
there is less open space, even though you you all did mention that that was one of the, the elements of the general plan. Um, I don't really see a lot of the open spaces being in, you know, in the design uh, photos that you all included, uh, but I do see a lot of high rises and a lot of industrial and mixed use buildings being included. So uh, my question is just in regards to space and how much um, I agree we, we, we do need to build up because the city is already limited on space, but at at the same time, by building up, that's also going to increase congestion, both in traffic, but also in density of housing and housing affordability. And um, a lot of the small businesses that are currently on Main Street, currently on, you know, Santa Ana Boulevard and those small industrial, uh, you know, folks that have their, their tiny companies there in those industrial spots, like, are they going to get first dibs in, in those buildings that get built? So what is essentially the, the plan for to avoid uh, displacement of those small businesses and of current residents and to ensure that they're able to stay in those homes um, as well as um, you know open spaces um, to, to be included in some of the, those designs. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, you know, again, we had a variety of comments in that statement, so I guess the, the ones I can speak to will just have to do with, uh, you know, open space. Uh, the city, uh, as you know, um, has to proceed with caution when looking at private property and needs to be very creative on how it can acquire additional open space. The land use element um, effectively has to create a vision for the, for the specific properties and by you know, designating a, a, a private piece of property with open space, it could kind of be seen as what's called a taking. So we need to think of creative, creative strategies through implementation to acquiring public uh, private property on behalf of the city, but those things would have to happen through actual purchases, through, you know, uh, pass through funds, through development projects and things like that. So, you know, that might explain why, you know, you're not seeing uh, areas that are just colored in green for the future plan. But um, we take your, your comments uh, this evening and, you know, we'll take them uh, into consideration as, as this plan moves forward. You made some valid points and, and we appreciate your comment. That has Melanie, not had, there, no. Yes, the next speaker that's not had an opportunity to share their comments is Cecilia Batista. And um, you're self-muted right now, Cecilia. Trying. Oh, yes, just I'm here. Thank you. How you get on the list to speak? I've been messaging, but I don't get any feedback. Hello? Good evening, Cecilia. Go ahead. Okay, good evening. My name is Cecilia Bautista. I live in 1234 East Borcher, and I'm very close by um, Madison, the school Madison. Um, I, I, I'm I want to make a comment about uh, what Mr. Jose Rea was talking about, the factory plastic. Actually, this affect me personally because my daughter, she's 13 years old and she has asthma. And what I know, a lot of residents around here, they do have kids with asthma. And this is really concerning me because um, I think before you, you you give a permit to a, to another factory, before they open, you really think about the community. You really need to think about the, the citizens who, who are living here. And this one, it makes me so, I mean, to me, I'm talking about myself also, because it's hard, it's hard for me. I have other two daughters. They were, they were not born here by my youngest, yes. So I always assume, but it's because I live right here and Brastic Company is just behind me. If I open my window, I make a lot of, sometimes I post it on Facebook because it really bothers me. They make a lot of noisy sounds during the day, night, sometimes during the weekend. I call the police. They know. Probably I bother too much, but I can't I can go to sleep. Sometimes I can't really go to sleep because of the noisy sounds. And they send the police, and I can see them because I have cameras around where I live. So if I open my window, I can see the police. They just stand in front of the, of the property. But they don't come before. I, I really invite all of you who give the permit to those companies, just take a walk. Come around during the day, around 9.30 at night. The company is working. They have, uh, you can hear the sound. 
So I invite all of you. You can give me a call and I can go with you. So please, I want you to really think about the kids. I want you, I want you to really think about that. We have a couple schools around. We have Century, I have a daughter at Century too. We have Kennedy and we have also um, Madison. So please consider before you give a permit. That's what I want to say. And, and the other thing, it's about the company, the brass tech. I know that they say that there, is a, there are regulations about the quality of the air. But I, I ask you, who really takes care of that? It's, is that true? What, they, what uh, are they doing over there? They're, they're, do, they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing? Or it's just like, oh, yeah, they're doing their work. But who's checking on that? So please, we need results on that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Cecilia. Do we have, um, I just kind of want to maybe uh, address the, the comment related to uh, the uses. As I mentioned, this general plan is, is kind of uh, like turning a ship, if you will. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to establish the goals and policies to get us home on actual zoning standards that will help us get to the the results which is what everybody wants immediate answers to um, there are some strategic things we can do um, with our zoning ordinance potentially with operational standards for example uh, to, to uh, ramp up um, some standards for those existing operators our goal is to try to control some of that um, through the zoning ordinance but also to try to prevent future uses you know um, as uh, like the ones that you're mentioning to uh, to create you know undue harm to, to our residents so I appreciate your comments this evening Vrini there are a, a number of other callers I'm going to list off the name of the next four just so they uh, know they're in the queue the next speaker will be um, will be uh, Janelle Hardy and then Ivan Enrique Juan Gonzalez and Leonel Flores. So the next one would be Janelle Harding. Thank you, Melanie. Um, can you tell me more or less how many speakers we have lined up just to give the public an idea? Uh, we have beyond the four that I mentioned, we have about five more. Okay. Uh, Janelle, um, good evening. Go ahead. Hello, Bernie. Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the land use focused areas, uh, specifically Henninger Park. My name is Janelle Hardy. Um, I live in Henninger Park neighborhood for, I've been here over 30 years. I live in the historic Haven House. Um, so this uh, slide that shows the land use uh, area, land use focus areas for South Maine, um, the yellow area, that sort of seems to consume in Hedinger Park, uh, South Broadway and South Sycamore. Um, it's showing low density residential. I don't think that's going to change. <clears throat> those, those homes, there's about um, 350, 400 homes uh, in this area. And um, most of them are just about 100 years old, some plus, some minus. I don't see them going away. Uh, there's at least half of them are Craftsman Bungalow style, which is we are the Craftsman Bungalow neighborhood. Um, so I'm guessing that it's just showing existing land use in this case. Um, the other land use is uh, appears to be uh, industrial at Cubbon, um, and that's. That's uh, Benjamin Franklin School, so I don't see that changing. Um, but what is changing, it looks like, is uh, actual South Main in Hedinger Park. That would be from First to McFadden, and it's proposing urban neighborhood. Well, in many cases, I'm thinking we're going to want to preserve the facades of the existing buildings. There are some historic structures there that. Um, would at least uh, contribute to the look and feel of the uh, at least 100 year old South Maine. And my main concern is for some Maine. You referred to an architectural study um, that when presented to South Maine uh, residents um, did not get popular support. 
Uh, we do not want to see um, the United Auto Building, which is now known as Original Mike's. You do not want to lose that historical asset. And I believe now there's some teeth um, that will prevent that from happening. So uh, can you address what, you know, how we can make sure that what was we saw proposed at yes. First in Maine and the uh, demise of Original Mike's, really the United Auto Building? Can you address that, please? Sure, sure. Uh, Janelle, thank you for your contributions with the Henninger Park neighborhood. Um, your first comment is absolutely correct. The areas that are identified as low density residential are not intended to change, much like Ms. Guerra's comment earlier about Willowick. There's no delta on the low density, the low density residential portion of South Maine. There is um, some provision for additional urban neighborhood along the edge of the commercial uses. And thank you for your comment about the potential to preserve those commercial storefronts. We're looking for ways to increase potentially um, some mixed use housing options with uh, in some cases keeping those storefronts that are largely at the property lines intact. And so um, I know the study uh, that you mentioned, Gensler had um, some, some wild illustrations, but you know, any future public realm plan would be brought before the community. So that's not what is getting adopted here uh, this evening. So hopefully that helps to answer your question. There's a, two, a couple other two comments you made. One was related to um, industrial flex. That would be solely limited to south of Warner Avenue. And the other color, which, you know, I kind of tend to agree with you is pretty close. It's kind of a light blue. Those are institutional uses. So those should be intended to be blue to reflect the, the schools that exist there today. The next speaker would be Mr. Enrique. Ivan, Ivan Enrique. Enrique. Hi, um, go ahead, Enrique. Uh, oh, this is Ivan. Is, um, is, uh, is it the same caller, Melanie? This yes. is Ivan Enriquez. Uh, okay. Yes, Ivan, so, go ahead, please. Good, good evening, Ivan. So, uh, good evening. So I was the chair of the Youth Commission in 2015, um, and I've worked jobs at UPS and, and Grubhub here in the city of Santa Ana. Um, and one of the areas uh, that I'm most concerned about is actually the uh, west uh, west section of uh, right here, West Santa Ana Boulevard in the focus area. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm concerned is because for the light rail system, for the streetcar system that's going to be put in, um, for that stop, it's not on both sides of the street. And if you look at the proportion of that stop um, in that focus area um, with the entire city, um, people that uh, travel south on Fairview to get to that station, for someone like myself, I live north of that station. Um, it's rel relatively easy for me to hop on the streetcar and go downtown, downtown Santa Ana. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is that people have to cross the street when you are uh, going north, like let's say on the bus, um, or if uh, let's say you need to drop someone off uh, at that station that, or if they just get dropped off, that they have to cross the street. Um, and if it gets busy, my concern is that uh, that's gonna uh, you know, conflict with the auto traffic there, which uh, is definitely going to be backing, backing up because of the station that's there. Um, and I don't really see like, like anything really mentioned about that. Um, I know I've brought up in the past with, uh, you know, OCTA about this issue, about this issue about where the station is only on one side of the street, and it's easy for residents like myself who live north of the station to hop on there. But for a majority of our residents who live south of the station, they have to cross the street. Um, the year that I was the, wow. youth, the chair of the youth commission, um, a young person, a youth, um, died every single week in the month of July because of a hit and run incident. Um, so that's the reason why I bring that up. So it's very important uh, for me that uh, you know narratives like that are included in documents like this um, for the area that's next. Uh, to the station that's uh, that uh, you know urban designation, the highlighted uh, purple. Um, it's not even on the chart for the page on 48. 
Um, so it's not part of the colors, the color scheme that's there. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so, you know, just, you know, small things like that matter. I know it's, a, it's on the West end, um, but, you know, just, just like an example of that, because on the, on every single stop uh, East, um, I believe like uh, they have another uh, couple stations where it's on both sides of the street to accommodate pedestrians um, or people on bicycles. So I just wanted to mention that. Ivan, thank you for your comments and you know for your contributions with the Youth Commission. Um, as I mentioned, this land use plan um, focuses on the private property, and so you know your comments are very valid. And certainly, uh, when it comes to the issues of lives taken because of public safety concerns, um, we have a few elements that are intended to address that type of detail. And you know, I, I, once the plans are released next week. I hope that you take the time to take a look at our circulation element uh, and there should be other elements there, safety and um, public safety as well, public services that hope to address some of these concerns. Um, we will uh, take your comments and make sure that we um, look closely at them. We appreciate your time. The next speaker would be Juan Gonzalez, if you can undo your mic. Yes, hello, this is Juan Gonzalez. I'm a born and raised Santanero and I'm currently in Memorial Park neighborhood. And my question actually builds on something that I've been hearing a lot this evening and it's with regards to uh, the development projects that were proposed with regards to the land use focus areas. Uh, specifically, the question is how has equity and even more specifically racial and socioeconomic equity been you know really centered in these plans and the reason that i ask this is that i think you know experience has shown both in this city in the county and the state even at the national level is that you know a lot of times these development projects you know they they have good in mind they obviously want to help the community but a lot of times it really just creates this domino effect where you know long time especially low-income residents are priced out and a lot of times the developments that are planned are just not made for them. You know, they're just not culturally compatible. They're not economically compatible. And so I'm just curious to hear how you're really gonna make sure that these development projects don't do more harm than good and really center um, the low income Latino residents that, you know, oftentimes live around these areas. Thanks. Juan, thank you for your comments. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the types of variety of housing that would uh, be available to our residents and uh, speaks to some of the prior callers, anti-displacement strategies, and looking at creative ways to um, increase affordability through, uh, you know, development standards that encourage things like sl small lot subdivisions or smaller units, um, creative housing options to uh, allow folks to move into non-traditional spaces. Um, the industrial portion of this um, of this focus area also speaks to small business and the makers of our city, um, shopkeepers and things like that. So our intent is to try to cater towards a growing um, section of our of our community that is very skilled, very artistic, very successful. There's no really uh, land use that fits that um, classification. So that was our attempt at creating this flex space. Uh, there's no perfect answer to your question, to be honest. Um, as the projects move through the system, um, I encourage you to continue to speak for you know, the topic that you, you rose here today. I know our housing opportunity ordinance is going through a series of modifications as well. So I encourage you to stay um, you know, focused on those opportunities to speak your concerns and to make sure that your uh, your comments are are um, are taken. We appreciate your time. Rennie, we have nine speakers that would still like to speak, and and it is of course eight o'clock. Um, the next one would be Lionel Flores. Hello. Hi. Um, good good evening, Lionel. Thank you for your presentation the other night at Henninger Park. I listened to it it was great so i'm anxious to hear what you have to say tonight okay yeah thank you so yeah um for those that don't know me i'm also a lifelong resident of santa Ana. i'm currently the community organizer for medicine park neighborhood association green 
And the first thing I want to start off with is I would just like to make the demand that the environmental impact report be delayed indefinitely so people have more time to review the general plan. Um, do you mind going back to slide number 60? Sure, Scott, can, can we get slide 60? 16 or 60? 60, 60. 60, okay. The reason I say that it should be delayed is because once this environmental impact report time, uh, report period is over, which is 45 days, uh, then the general plan will go to vote to the city council. So basically, they're giving us 45 days to decide to give input and decide what we want to see change without even having seen the general plan. You mentioned a lot about how you've been working on this since 2016, how there's the general plan framework and things like that, but the framework is not the general plan. You could have, let's put it an example of a pizza. You could have the dough, you could have the sauce, you could have the ingredients, but it's not a pizza until it's out there and it's made. The framework is not the general plan and no one has seen the general plan. So just because of that, it should be delayed and people should be given enough time to actually review and learn about the problems that our city is facing. Um, secondly, you know, you say there's a lot of mistrust of the city. And to be honest, I think this meeting kind of like increased my mistrust for the city. Um, if you could, uh, I think this question is gonna be for Melanie. Um, early in the presentation when they were talking about uh, environmental justice in the industry. Um, I think you mentioned that uh, you guys are currently working to get the permits uh, for the industries that emit chemicals, correct? We actually have been in dialogue, this is Melanie, we've been in dialogue with the um, for public records request a couple of months back from the Air Quality Management District and from the Orange County Environmental Health and that's at the stage we're at. Okay, so so like you mentioned, a couple of months, y'all have been saying you've been working on to, on this since 2016, but you just said you've only made a request of a couple of months ago. So what, since May, since you announced these meetings, like does that really show you're looking out for the best interests of the community? The city doesn't even know what chemicals are being released into the air next to these communities. Sir, you know? sir, if I could interject again, uh -huh. as I as I tried to frame earlier. These kinds of specific activities, which we we um, are are very supportive of, they're implementation actions, uh, just like buying more land for parks, uh, like doing our our park master plan. They're implementation actions. It would not be done as part of the um, general plan proper. They're typically follow up actions to help reach our goal, and that goal being a healthy environment which is one of our key values. And um, so they're typically follow-up actions. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That's fine if it's follow-up. But the thing is, you, you, like you just said it, it's follow-up. You guys are not even checking to see what these companies are putting into the air. You guys are just letting these companies come in and not even monitoring what they're doing. So you just proved it right there. You said it's follow-up. So right there, that proves that the city is not looking out for the people. So that creates a lot of mistrust for me. If you can go to, uh, do you think you can go to slide 52? Scott, can we get 52, please? You know, you spend a whole hour talking about bringing in all these new buildings and mixed use and, you know, bringing all this housing. But like one of the key points, the second to last point on this slide is protect industrial and office employment. You focused the whole hour on protecting industry, but you only gave 15 minutes to protecting the environment and the quality of our city. So that right there shows where the city's focus on as well. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how you expect us to trust the city when this is what you're presenting. You know, you can go on for hours and can go on about industry and bringing in business and this and that, but the only the only policy you were able to give us about fixing the air quality was, oh, maybe we can add parts. Maybe we can give incentives for the companies to move out, but there was, there was nothing else concrete about it. So I really don't, I don't, I really don't see how you expect us to think the city did their diligent job in following SB 1000 and engaging the community and 
making sure that the community's input is involved and and is protected and and i i just want to end with you know you're trying to bring in all this housing all this mixed use all these developments for people to live in but we have the worst air quality not in the county but in the state we're in the top 90 percent okay and you want to bring more people into santa ana santa ana is already overcrowded that should be a crime against humanity because we're breathing polluted air. So that's why I'm demanding that the environmental impact report be delayed indefinitely until the general plan is out and the citizens are given sufficient time to review it and provide their input. So that'll be Thank my you. final comment. Thank you for your comments, Lionel. Thank you. Next, next uh, speaker, Melanie, please. Elizabeth Medina Munoz. Hi, good evening, Elizabeth. Hi, good evening. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm just here to talk about like how I'm part of the Qual Committee of MP and Green, and I also want to just talk about like how you guys in the beginning were talking about how you guys are planning uh, put, putting all these industries here in Santa Ana and developing like all these housings for like for like different sections of the affected areas. But I just wanted to know like when you guys create these housings, like when these people are like in small industries are taken away or removed will they all they have a say in this too or what's gonna happen and i also want to focus on like how like putting in the maps in some kind i saw some industries surrounding like some areas specifically like small low resident residence homes like like factories and stuff like that and i just wanted to say like it's not a good idea like i feel like you should delay the general plan until the, like the community had a say in this because it's not fair for us residents to deal with the impact it may have, it might be bring, it might be a good idea in the first place, but it also has di different side effects in the in the end of this outcome. Like there's like in, in Madison Park, there's like plastics is like near Kennedy and Madison Park. It's like we don't even know the type of chemical is polluting, and the proximity of that area is really close to those schools. And many students are like with health conditions are suffering with asthma or other respiratory lung disease as well. And like, like Halona said in the beginning, like you guys are trying to show like capitalism, tourism, to try to bring in like to promote our city. But Santa Ana has is uh, populated with thousands of residents here. Like we need to focus on like fixing these issues first, economically and and physically here where we're facing for a long time now. First, and when we're resolved with this, then we can move on with economic or like tourism, but right now we need to focus on these general ideas that could affect us. Elizabeth, uh, thank you for your comments. The next speaker would be Catherine Cox. Hi, good evening, Catherine. Hello. Hi, yes, my um, comment is not for me. It's actually for someone who is unable to make a comment because of the lack of language access on this platform that I mentioned before. So I'm gonna read it in um, Spanish and then translate it in English. Soy Alicia Salgado, pertenezco a Neighborhood Association Madison Park. Hay mucha contaminación existente en nuestra comunidad de las 42 fábricas cerca de nuestros hogares y las escuelas de nuestros hijos. Demandamos que sea ley donde especifique una distancia grande para establecer fábrica que emitan contaminación tóxica cerca de escuelas o departamentos. Demandamos una junta para cada comunidad que tiene problemas como los de la nuestra para que escuchen nuestras preocupaciones y los tomen en cuenta en la elaboración de justicia ambiental en el plan general. My name is Alicia Salgado. I'm a member of Madison Park Neighborhood Association. There is a large amount of pollution in our community from over 42 polluters near our homes and the schools of our children. We are calling for a law that requires a greater distance between factories that emit toxic pollution near schools and apartment buildings. We demand you hold meetings for each community that has problems like those of our community so that you can hear our concerns and take them into account in the development of environmental justice policies in the general plan. Thank you. Thank you for your comments on behalf of Alicia. Um, thank you for translating them as well. Um, we appreciate your time tonight. The next speaker would be uh, Sandra Pochapena. Hey, Hi. hello. Hi, good evening, Sandra. Yes, 
Uh, so I'm a I'm a lifelong resident here of uh, East Side Pacific Park, uh, bordering Standard. Uh, so it's a very affected area by a lot of these toxins. And my mom worked for one of these, you know, gross polluters for MB Planning. So I have firsthand knowledge just how toxic it can get. And um, just in reviewing the documents that are posted on the website, it seems like there really hasn't been a voice included from anybody in the eastern side of the city. You know, you had a whole year, 2017, of a steering committee that included is with half developers, you know, half, uh, you know, mostly planning commissioners, but there were zero people, zero people from the eastern side of Santa Ana. There were zero businesses from our polluted eastern side, zero residents involved. Um, so really our voice, and the things that matter to us, were, we were not consulted and we were not included in this plan. So now I understand and I appreciate that you're trying to kind of retrofit after many years of building this plan. You know, you're trying to include these considerations, but you can't do it in a few months. You need to take the time to actually give meaningful solutions. Like one of the meaningful solutions is there should really be a phasing out of this heavy industry and manufacturing in Santa Ana. Our land is too valuable to be used for heavy industry and manufacturing now. We have seen in the past how aerospace companies like Northrop Grumman have come in to our city with incentives and then they've, they've poisoned our water and then they've split and we the residents get stuck with the cleanup costs and the bills for 20, 30 years after they leave. Generations are affected. So I don't see anywhere in this plan a phase out plan or like people have mentioned some kind of, uh, of uh, policy so that no more heavy industry and manufacturing is allowed and the industries that are here polluting, they can start to phase out and maybe go to Barstow or some Inland Empire area where, you know, the land is not as valuable, you know, as it is in Santa Ana, we're a beach community. So um, we need to listen to our residents because we're a growing city and we can't have cancer clusters all over mini street and all over these areas it's it's a liability it's it's not right and to not have our our voice included so i i ask that the general plan uh update be postponed until next year we're in a major health uh pandemic right now so we really need to proceed forward correctly and with caution and thoughtfully because every decision everything that's laid out in this plan is going to affect all of us for 20 30 years Th thank you for your comments um i appreciate your your uh, perspective and uh, taking the time to speak with us i just want to clarify um looking back at our outreach back in 2016 i do see that we were out in ward one on thursday march 24th at 6 p.m Madison Elementary School. Uh, my notes here show that 14 folks were in attendance where we launched the initial outreach um, listening phase of the general plan. So I appreciate your comments and you know if there is an opportunity to to provide um, uh, further information to your uh, to your ward and area, um, we, we'd be happy to do that. So thank you for your time tonight. The next speaker would be Maria de la Angeles Diaz. Maria, can you unmute your, thank you. Hi, Maria. All right, let's try Maria one more time. Melanie, can we move on to the next caller? And we'll Certainly. Get back to Maria. Victor Bustos. Hi, Victor. Hi, I, I just wanted to echo what everybody's saying. I really think it needs to be postponed. Um, it, it doesn't sound like we even know what these companies are putting out in the air, and yet we have a plan. I didn't hear anything about the fixes. Or did I miss it in the presentation? 
Does that conclude your question, Victor? Yeah, that was a question. All right, thank you for your question. Um, as I mentioned, what we've tried to do tonight is provide some overview on some potential policies and implementation. It doesn't, it's not an exhaustive list of all the policies and goals, which are gonna be posted here uh, as soon as this week on our city's website. Uh, implementation is uh, the most important part, in my opinion, of showing how our goals and policies are gonna be accountable. And so uh, I encourage you to, to continue um, uh, interacting with our process through the through the um, future hearing process uh, there, Victor. Thank you. Our is next Maria call back with us? Maria Diaz? The next caller then would be Irma. Hi, good evening, Irma. Hello? Hi, yes. Irma. Oh, hi. Uh, yes. Good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more extensive talk on a comment or a, one of the points that was made about the incompatible land uses when they're adjacent to each other. I would like a little bit more explanation um, of how that, because that I think that might be a point of interest where two incompatible uses, the heavy industrial and the residential schools, how that would specifically work, um, moving one out, identifying, uh, relocating, uh, because you did mention that, and I think that might be a point of interest to everybody because we are concerned. I'm in Wilshire Square, a 40-year resident, 41-year resident of Wilshire Square, I live in Madison and Wilshire Square, and health affects all of us uh, from a physical, mental, and I think that um, in the past we weren't aware of how much damage, but now that uh, we see that some uses are incompatible next to each other, but they're needed, then how are you going to relocate a, a, a one or the other or start phasing out? So I think that would be a point of interest for all. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, Irma. Thank you for your contribution. I know you were uh, heavily involved through our general plan process and I remember hearing and seeing you at the previous meeting, so thank you. Uh, on the topic of uh, compatibility, there continues to be some uh, uses that uh, create um, hazardous situations between, um, specifically between residential and industrial uses, as some callers kind of mentioned this evening. Uh, I mentioned through the general plan process, uh, some tools through future land use changes. So land use is, is kind of like the future, the city's guide for future zones that could uh, exist within a property. Um, once we establish a specific land use, then we have to locate appropriate zoning to coincide with that land use. In this case, what we're doing with the general plan is twofold. First off, we're looking at areas where we could modify the standard industrial land use designation and substitute it for one that's cleaner, which is the flex industrial in this case. So that's what's being done on the, on the land use plan for the general plan. We also looked at some potential implementation strategies, such as amortization of existing uses, which means giving operators X amount of time to relocate to facilities that are outside of these areas. And then uh, lastly, we discussed the zoning code update, which would be the future um, you know, zone or permitted uses listed within each zone that would then be consistent with the land use plan and looking carefully at how our new uses would be not continuing that path of introducing harmful um, interactions between our residents and our commercial uses. So I'll give you an example. You know, hog slaughtering and processing was once allowed in the city in like the 40s and 50s in our zoning code. Some of those uses over time have been eliminated. So now we have uses that are a bit more modern with plating and, and auto uses and things that have similar effects. So this is the time to revisit those incompatible uses and address them through the zoning code update. Thank you for your time. We have seven speakers remaining. Uh, the one that has not had an opportunity to speak so, thus far is Victor Payan. Victor, good evening. Can you unmute your... Uh, your connection, Victor? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Okay. How are you doing? Just, uh, um, it's a fascinating conversation, but I wanted to just add that um, 
in terms of the process of speaking, I signed in from the app and I don't know which one I'm on right now, but I was on hold for like an hour and there was no indication that I was in line. So now I'm on my phone too. And I have an echo because I don't know which one is on, which one is active. Um, but what I wanted to say was that um, I agree with the uh, majority of the folks on, on the call here that you should extend the time of the, of the plan uh, sessions because there is a lot of uh, input that's lacking um, and that it seems the committee was not representative of residents who are expressing their concerns. And these are folks that have invested in the city, their lives, their dreams, and you know, um, you know, their, their needs need to be represented. I attended several of the South Main meetings and um, it was clear that they did not want to be an extension of the downtown. They wanted to have their own identity and, and, and history celebrated and have a resident focused commercial and cultural district. Um, I never heard that they were in favor of high rises or being another uh, extension of downtown. There's been a lot of, uh, of damage in the downtown. Now you go and it's, um, you know, it's, it's empty a lot of the nights. I know some people benefit, but as a resident, I don't honestly go into downtown myself. There are other parts of, of Santa Ana that I, I, I like more. Um, and so just to be aware of that, that, you know, that the residents need to lead the discussion. And I know that the committee had a lot of uh, planning commissioners and, and developers. And I think that there was someone that owned a furniture store and that they wanted South Maine to be a furniture district. So uh, I don't think it's the ideas that are representative of what we could be dreaming for and achieving. I think technology is something that can be really, uh, you know, beneficial to the area. I proposed several times over the years a smart corridor South Main art retail technology so that we could bring in community technology centers and, and uh, digital businesses that don't have a big toxic footprint, but also create jobs for the local community. <clears throat> the Latino market is a $1.7 trillion uh, economic force. And I've noticed in the past you know, five or 10 years, a move away from <clears throat> Latino centric businesses, which is the majority of the population of Santa Ana. But I think that's a lost opportunity and a misguided approach because that's where the money is. And I think they want to talk about attracting customers, attracting businesses, creating revenue from the residents um, you know, you need to be aware of that and seeing downtown become more bars and tattoo parlors. Uh, like I said, it, it, the charm that, that I liked about it is gone. I don't want to see that happen to South Main or other parts of, of the city. Um, and also to say that uh, the lessons from the downtown was that uh, after a heavy investment of being a cultural district, it became suddenly overnight an entertainment district. And those are two very different things with different goals. And um, I don't want to see that happen to South Maine or other communities. We do need a cultural district. Maine from uh, from the Bowers to Car not Carbon, not from the Bowers to Rickenbacker, that's a cultural district right there. Um, but we're, nobody's talking about that. So uh, also in terms of flex use of, of, of industrial zones and whatnot, I also proposed a couple of years ago when I was on the Arts uh, Master Plan Steering Committee, creating arts empowerment zones. So you can create zoning and policy and incentives for property owners to work with artists in a real partnership and designate parts of town that would be cultural areas so that it's not just up to um, the artists to come in and then the developers to benefit and everybody to lose in the long run. Um, also, um, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, we need more luxury developments. Uh, Three minutes, please. Uh, okay, then we'll wrap up and not in the main neighborhood. Thank you. I think the Property in Santa Ana is is uh, you know people are going to want to develop it. So if the city makes demands on what they want, if the residents make demands on what they want, people will build. So you don't have to just cater to the you know the luxury apartments. Look at what's happening now. We need affordable. We need to be respectful of COVID. We need to listen to the residents, uh, bring in all the voices for this plan, and then again to request uh, postponing it. Victor, thank you for your comments. Um, some some good points there this evening, and thank you for sticking through the the meeting. And uh, we're all trying to adapt to this new uh, format. So I appreciate your comments and your time. I know, but if I cut out one, Vernie, we have um, seven or so more speakers. Um, some just um, raised their hand in the last 20 minutes or so, so I'm not sure how you'd like to handle the time frame. But Adolfo Sierra, who's spoken once before, has been waiting to speak again for quite some time. So Adolfo? Thank you. One thing, Melanie, if, if someone has already kind of spoken and given comments, if we can kind of just defer to those that haven't. 
And then, you know, at this point, this isn't a public hearing or official meeting, so I'm open as long as everyone else is to stay on and listen to folks kind of speak. Um, but you know, that's the only consideration I'd like to make is if, if you've spoken already, please allow others and, you know, perhaps think about tomorrow's session as well as an opportunity. I realize everyone's not available tomorrow, so go ahead. Was our next speaker? Annette Martinez would be um, someone that has recently raised their hand. Annette, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Hello, um, my name is Annette Martinez. I am 16 years old and I have lived in San Antonio for most of my time here. Currently, I am a member of the Quad Committee and have been over four years. The Quad Committee is where we discuss the problems in our committee and how we can help and also learn and acknowledge the rights the whole community has. What I'm here to talk about is about the Santa Ana generator plan and my request for more time to be taken and not be finalized yet. The reason why I request more time is because those who actually live within the community and are being affected by the final plan are not being heard of. There has been no consideration of the voices of the community's residents themselves. My question is, how are you going to finalize the plan without actually living within the community and not knowing how everyone is being affected individually? As you can see, schools from preschools, elementaries, intermediates, and high schools are extremely close to these factories that contaminate the air with unknown chemicals. Not only schools are being close to these factories, but also buildings of apartments where a large quantity of families are living are being littered right next to these factories. A home is considered a safe place for many, but again, how is that possible with many factories contaminating the air and causing health and other problems to families? Also, the community, if it's being informed, it's either being informed too late to even have a say in whatever decision there has to be taken, or it's either being informed in another language that they do not speak or can read. It can be extremely unfair for the plan to be finalized with not hearing from the residents themselves. Also, from the general plan and the sites that you have presented, there has been a sale of building these new um, luxury homes or all these buildings when actually there has no necessity since San Ana itself has to be like fixed. The homeless um, problem is still out there. Why not fix that first, then go on? But then again, there's many problems and that should be fixed first, then going on. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time and for stick, sticking with us this evening. And you know, you have all you have some very valid points. As you know, the general plan is a pretty complex document that covers many, many subjects. So it's it's tough to it's a it's a tough uh, um, nut to crack and try to resolve you know all of the city's um, all of the city's uh, current issues and future issues. So you can imagine what we're trying to do is try to plan for for a city's future and at the same time try to address some issues for today so i appreciate your time i think we have adolfo um on the line now go ahead adolfo oh muchas gracias estaba uh, perdón me habían puesto um al mute <laughs> uh, una de las preguntas que tengo e inclusive lo voy a subir este inclusive en la en las redes sociales Primero que nada, una de ellas es, y Margarita ya me contestó en un correo electrónico, es cuánto dinero generan las industrias que están establecidas en Santa Ana y que contaminan. ¿Cuánto de este dinero contribuyen ellos al, al presupuesto anual para saber cuál es el costo beneficio como se le llama en, en inglés, en economía, uh, benefit cost, y saber si realmente las ocupamos aquí en la ciudad. Y si no, creo que la, uh, la ciudad debería empezar a cerrarlas definitivamente. La segunda es, ¿por qué no en este tipo de reuniones tenemos a las personas que toman las decisiones y que crean, en este caso, las pólizas 
y procedimientos, como le decimos aquí en inglés, policies and procedures, para que nos estén escuchando directamente. Me estoy refiriendo al concilio de la ciudad, que eso incluye al alcalde y también a, al, a la manager de la ciudad y a la abogada de la ciudad. Y inclusive al, al director ejecutivo de planeación y construcción, que es el, el señor, no sé si es arquitecto o ingeniero, no sé qué sea, uh, Min Tai, que inclusive hace rato mencioné acerca de, de enviar la información, uh, me imagino que él es este, vietnamís, uh, a su comunidad. Entonces, creo que es demasiado importante que ellos directamente escuchen de nosotros, no a través de ustedes, algunos de los uh, empleados de la ciudad que inclusive por mi experiencia por muchos años han servido de filtro para que la información no llegue hacia ellos e inclusive, inclusive uh, son este, mal informados, inclusive a veces uh, los, uh, los oficiales electos de la ciudad. Entonces, esas dos son dos, mis, mis dos preguntas. Ojalá mañana, uh, sábado, pudieran por ahí, me imagino que sí deben tener algunos datos, porque deben tener los datos para saber cuánto dinero traen estas industrias contaminantes a la ciudad. Y si no, pues para deshacernos de ellas, porque inclusive económicamente no servirían de nada. Y por el otro lado, que nos escuchen directamente a uh, nuestros uh, oficiales electos y empleados, voy a decir empleados, porque así se dice staff uh, en español. Y sigo hablando en español porque quiero dirigirme a la gran mayoría de la gente que no tiene una voz en la ciudad y que debería... Y que We're at the three minute mark, sir. Gracias. Uh, pero espero esas respuestas mañana, esas uh, respuestas a esas dos preguntas. Gracias. Les agradezco uh, que me hayan dado el tiempo. Gracias, Adolfo. Si gusta, como habla inglés, si gusta decirlo en, en inglés, pero nada más los dos puntos, por favor. Adolfo. All right, Adolfo seems to have left us, but just so I can summarize, he had questions as to the economic benefits of changing uh, the industrial uses to an other use and what uh, long-term economic benefits industrial and commercial uses have on the city's overall uh, budget. And then the second part of it had to do with just uh, the citizens having a voice in the community through the various stages of staffing and then through the directors and finally to the decision makers. So he had concerns about that wants to make sure that um, his concerns are heard and overall he feels like he wanted to speak in Spanish so he can reach out to the community that is most affected by this general plan. Thank you, Adolfo. The next speaker yes. would be, the next speaker would be Joel Munoz. Hi, good evening, Joel. Hello. Yes, good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try to keep this short. So. My name is Joel Muñiz. I am 18 years old and have lived in the Madison Park community for 15 plus years. I am here to request for a delay to the general plan process in order to adequately incorporate environmental justice in the general plan. Within the Madison Park community, there are numerous factories surrounding the area, some of which are especially close to schools and residential areas. The amount of factories in the area have resulted in an increase of health problems. More and more children in the area are being diagnosed with asthma or similar health problems, mainly respiratory related. The foul odors, odors that emit from companies in the area are nauseating. The people who live near these companies have complained again and again, yet nothing seems to happen. It is as if these problems are simply being swept under the rug solely because it is a lower income neighborhood. So I'm gonna just be real here. And I'm pretty sure that none of you live in the area, so therefore have no clue what it is that this community needs. And if you do live here, then why haven't you done anything? So I say postpone the general plan and give a voice to the community that has suffered long enough. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, 
How many? Um, next speaker, please. Uh, the next speaker that has not had an opportunity yet is Melissa Ballerman. Hi, good evening, Melissa. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just would like to echo what everybody else was saying about the general plan prolonging it. Um, I also think it's a necessity to do more outreach on it. Um, I personally found out about the general plan meeting today. Um, so I think that's a necessity. Um, but also, as I was looking through the images and looking uh, where Buffalo Wild Wings is located, I personally live right behind um, and within those complexes, the apartments. And I find the um, building of these high rises to be highly problematic. Just because when you look at certain data, whether um, you can see that we do have a high um, pollution area within here with the PM25 toxic releasing and things in that nature. When you look at the California Health, uh, Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, um, we can see that there is a pollution issue. I also think when we look at previous um, um, outreach when it comes to community, our community um, within Santa Ana did not agree for the 25-25 apartments. Um, we do not need or there's not a necessity to gentrify or do like luxury luxury hotels or um, homes in that um, arena because of the fact of the matter is majority of us are already um, going through a housing burden. We uh, Many of us have to pay majority of our income towards paying for an apartment. Um, I personally have had trouble finding an apartment that's below 2000 with my minimum wage income that I personally make. Um, I believe that when we build these industrialized and we build these high rise buildings, we are displacing many members of our community. Um, and we look at the Buffalo Wild Wings area, we are displacing many people in terms of jobs. There's so many stores within that area. And to build these high rise areas, I don't believe that this is for the betterment of our community. Um, when we talk about bettering our community, we have an opportunity gap within Santa Ana when we look at Irvine, right? We have, they're, they're paying majority, 27% of open space goes to Santa, um, Irvine, but for us it's 4%, right? And I don't know if you guys touched upon um, Willowick, 120 acres of land, that could do so much for our community. Within that area, we can see there's a high pollution. Um, I know personally, when I was um, looking at what's going on uh, on the land, um, Garden Grove wanted to give the land to hotels, right? And we don't need hotels. We need to open space. 4%, even within those 4%, the amenities, we don't have a lot of amenities. We don't have a large area. I personally have to go to Irvine to go hiking because when you come to Santa Ana, there's barely anything. And what the things we do have are small and they're not up to date or uh, for the betterment of our community in terms of playing or in terms of just relaxing because they're so tiny and so far away. Um, so when I think of that, I want to know what, I don't know if, if you guys touched on Willowick, but what are we doing directly to um, paying more attention to Willowick, making sure that the land goes to environmental um, housing, um, open space, making sure we have a park that's large enough for our community. I think that's an important thing we have to look at because the fact of the matter is um, our community is suffering, right? We, we can see a huge difference when we go to Irvine to Santa Ana, we can see um, What's Excuse the priority? Me, the three minute mark. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to ask that. I you. think we need to pay more attention to our community and what their needs are. We already heard what we need, and we don't need these high industrial um, businesses and these um, buildings as well. So thank you. Thank you for your comments and, and your time this evening. We have three more speakers um, right. Diane Fradkin. Dale Helvig and Catherine Cox would like to speak again. Diane Frandic, um, Fradkin has been waiting the longest. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Diane Fradkin. I'm going to have my husband, John, speak first. Hi, guys. Uh, John Fradkin from Park Santiago and uh, Diane's husband. Um, I just want to, my comment's kind of global in nature. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in, it has changed the world and its effect on real estate development going forward is going to be very profound. And I wonder if um, you guys have taken that into consideration. I know that, uh, you know, you, you can't spin on a dime and it's been a long process and I, I totally get that. But still, I wonder if we aren't 
pursuing old pre-pandemic goals as if nothing were different because things are different now. And um, I was reading the uh, city of Santa Ana land use element as far as the goals and goal six is to reduce residential overcrowding to promote public health and safety. And I would argue that um, anything that's going to increase the density of Santa Ana is not promoting public health. And most of the changes that uh, we are, uh, that are in your, your new plan are in fact going to increase the density. And uh, I think we should rethink that. Um, I think that it's inevitable that uh, there's gonna be less need for office space and there's gonna be plenty of adaptive reuse of existing office space into residential. That's gonna happen, probably retail also. And uh, I'm okay with this uh, urban neighborhood thing, but let's define it um, a little more specifically. And it doesn't have to be high density. And you know, I think the world going forward is going to be different. And um, you know, if it needs an elevator, it's probably too big. Um, those are pretty much my thoughts. So um, I'll let uh, let Diana in here. Um, this is Diane Pratt, and I just had a couple of follow-up questions specific to the presentation. Um, I noticed that you had the urban neighborhood use on several of the uh, areas, South Main, uh, South Bristol, and also on uh, Grand and 17th. And under each of those, you had different uh, dwelling units per acre. So on South Main, you showed 20 DUAs. On South Bristol, you showed 30 DUAs. And on Grand and 17th, you showed 40 DUAs. And um, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Um, perhaps we can't get into it right now, but I think, you know, there needs to be, I need to understand that a little bit more. That's, that's definitely undefined there because it's just um, uh, a wide, it's such a wide variety for the one use. And then I think just to piggyback on what everybody else has said, we're here tonight giving input based on the presentation that you made, which was very good. But now you're telling us that the draft EIR is going to be available on August 3rd, which is Monday. So you have not incorporated any of the comments from this community meeting tonight into your draft EIR, into your plan. So I think you've got the cart before the horse here. Um, and I know you've put a lot of work and a lot of time into this. But to echo most of what everybody has said, we need to take a step back before we start running and we just need to walk this forward a little bit more. Um, and I thank you for your time and your input and um, thank you for um, the opportunity to speak and I look forward to uh, more conversations in the future. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Frankin. Um, you know, just to, to address the first comment there having to do with uh, COVID, None of us kind of had the crystal ball, uh, you know, that this was coming for us. And, you know, we have a project to move forward. And, you know, of course, we're all cognizant that things are changing. You know, our society is changing daily. We're meeting now, uh, you know, from our homes in certain cases. So, you know, uh, I encourage you to come and speak for, uh, you know, on behalf of, you know, either your neighborhood or yourself um, to our electeds to see, you know, what you need in terms of uh, changes to the plan, if that's something that you see uh, evolving. We're also seeing some um, comments related to the, the issues that you just brought up this evening. So thank you for your comments on that. And to Ms. Fredkin, uh, your comments related to uh, the UN designation, that's correct. Each of the focus areas potentially would have different ranges and heights established to try to re be respectful of those uh, individual areas and adjacency to some of the residential uses um, and you know understand your concerns with the timing of it all uh, appreciate your comments this evening the next right. speaker the next speaker would be uh, dale helvig hi dale hey bernie how are you doing tonight uh, thanks for doing this and sticking around past eight o'clock i know it's been a long day for you guys uh, couple comments uh, that is the 
as many people have said already, some of my comments, the draft EIR is coming out on Monday. And if I heard correctly, the land use element won't be available until a couple of weeks from now, maybe. So it's hard to look at the draft EIR when you don't even have the, the base document to compare it to as far as what we're trying to uh, ob obtain in the city. Now it says, you know, we have a shared vision for Santa Ana, but I don't know what that shared vision is because again, the, the draft uh, of the general plan is not available for us. One of the things that concerns me is the layout of the focus areas. And as Diane mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you have a, a different way of presenting each focus area. Uh, the main street shows uh, single family residents uh, bordering the changes that you wanna make. The 17th and Grand does not. It just shows everything as an urban neighborhood, including the uh, uh, institutional property of the post office at Santa Clara and Grand. And it looks like people just went through and just plopped it down and called it the uh, urban neighborhood without really thinking about what it was really going to entail. Now, with all the developments that have been shown for all the focus areas, I can imagine, you know, because it's a, a really uh, potentially a 20 year document that we're creating a vision for the future. The vision that I see is doing nothing but create higher density housing throughout the city more business parks or whatever, but it's going to cause at least an increase of 20,000 people into the city, which as another caller said, we are the highest density city of our size in Orange County. And if we are to maintain the open space requirements, that's 40 acres of land that we need to have for open space. You know, I, I don't see how we can do that. and. If it's truly a vision, then the general plan ought to be showing the vision for open space as well as urban neighborhood. You know, we take a look at uh, uh, some of these slides, like uh, I think it's slide 40 for, uh, uh, well, that's original Mike's, uh, which again, broad brush stroke urban neighborhood. But uh, there's some other slides in there along uh, uh, the OC streetcar, there's an electronic shop there. Now, the vision is that at some point in time in the future, we're going to displace that electronic recycling store and put in an urban neighborhood facility. Why can't we show the vision and say, okay, these are the areas that we would like to have as open space? And I don't want to hear that, well, the open space element's going to cover that. The uh, park master plan is going to cover that. The land use element needs to cover that as well, because what are we trying to do? A comprehensive update. And if we don't have a comprehensive update, all we're doing is issuing the new 12 elements that are unique and individual without intertwining with the other ones. And having the park master plan come out after all of this is there, it's too late. Or are we going to revise the general plan to incorporate the park master plan? I don't know how that's all going to work. And again, we're going to displace companies or businesses. So, excuse because, me, that's three minute mark. Okay. Well, I, I thank you for your time and I'll be back tomorrow. Thank you, Dale, for your comments. We're going to get through the remainder of the comments here. Melanie. The last of the, the last of the three speakers that I mentioned earlier is Catherine Cox. Catherine, good evening again. Hi, <clears throat> I'm reading a comment from Maria de los Angeles Diaz, whose name has been called a few times but wasn't able to respond because the non-English speakers are listening on a separate platform from the main meeting. Um, so I'll read in Spanish and then in English. Mi nombre es Ángeles Díaz, soy parte del Grupo Cual y parte de la Comunidad de Madison Park, 
y para mí es preocupante la contaminación que existe en nuestro vecindario, ya que afecta severamente a nuestras familias. Principalmente lo veo en mi familia que les ha afectado continuamente con dolor de cabeza por la alta contaminación. Asimismo, existe aquí un alto índice de asma a diferencia de otros lugares. Y estoy aquí para exigir que se tome más tiempo para implementar adecuadamente medidas de justicia ambiental y que tomen en cuenta nuestra voz porque merecemos ser incluidos, porque formamos parte de la comunidad de Madison Park. My name is Angeles Diaz. I am part of the Qual Committee and part of the Madison Park community. I am very concerned about the pollution in our neighborhood that severely affects our families. In my family, I've seen that they are affected by headaches from the high amount of pollution. And in our area, there are much higher rates of asthma compared to other places. I am here to urge you to take more time to adequately implement EJ measures that take into our account our voices. We deserve to be included because we are a part of this community. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, uh, Angeles. We have a few. Um, Margarita Macedonio has informed me that there's a few Spanish speaking um, comments that she'd like to read into the, the meeting this evening. So I'm going to allow for that. Uh, Margarita, go ahead. Uh, Vernie, it's going to be me, Alyssa. So I documented a Hello. couple of Spanish questions. Um, so the first one is from Yesenia Marujo from Madison Park. And her question is, is the city going to allow permits for businesses around the area like Brass Tech. So, and then the second one, uh, Catherine read, um, it's from a Spanish caller, uh, Angeles Diaz, which she is part of the Quad group and she's lived in Madison Park for 15 years. She's worried about the contamination her family is affected by. Her son suffer from headaches and she thinks it's due to the contamination in the area. And she knows a lot of uh, kids ar around her neighborhood that have asthma. She would like for there to be more time for input for residents to discuss the environmental justice in their community. Uh, third comment is from uh, resident Yesenia Marujo. She's been a resident in Madison Park for six years. Uh, she mentioned that there are too many factories near her home and that the air smells like bleach. Uh, the factories emit loud noises and she wants something to be done so residents don't have to suffer with those issues. And the last comment that we got um, was from the same person, Yesenia. She wants to know what is going to be done about the homeless and the trash that accumulates in the area and who is going to clean it up. And that completes the comments for the Spanish question. Thank you, Alyssa. And I know a few of those comments came through on um, both platforms. So I appreciate the, the appreciate the passion for the subject of the general plan. Uh, we're just trying to be open and um, listen to all the comments as they come through. It's almost nine o'clock. So I just want to thank all of the callers that are still on with us tonight. Just to remind everyone, there's going to be another meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to have to you know, just get up right and early to make sure that we can um, hopefully accommodate folks that aren't available this evening, but instead in the morning. And then we chose a weekend to try to to be open to, to folks uh, that were available then. So we appreciate everyone's comments this evening. And, um, you know, on behalf of staff, thank you for, for uh, providing feedback on our process so far. Uh, there's still quite a, a few opportunities to provide comment, both in writing, uh, through our process of adoption. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I don't know if Min, do you have any closing remarks or if you're still there? I'm still here. Thank you, Vernie. And I really appreciate the community and staying with us to, on a Friday night. I know you probably have other things that you would like to do, but by you being here and discussing and sharing your concerns, it really shows that, you know, there's a lot of issues that we're hearing tonight that are very important to you. We are taking notes and as um, our staff, Vernie has mentioned, uh, quite a few times we have uh, opportunities uh, throughout this process that we have provided um, the dates for that you are able to continue to provide input even as we go through the uh, the process, uh, the formal process of reviewing and uh, discussion and public hearing process. So again, I really appreciate um, your participation tonight. Your questions and comments have been noted and we'll continue and hopefully um, um, maybe some of you can come back tomorrow as well. Thank you and good night.